Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Senate Finance and Guest. Today is Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. We have nine bills before the committee for consideration today. They will be heard in the following order. Senate Bill 798, 786, 554, 550, 724, 725, 601, 678, and Senate Bill 648. To our guests, our members are going to be uh, leaving throughout the hearing. They have presentations in other committees, mean no disrespect to you or your testimony. If they're not in their seats, they're likely presenting in another committee and will return as swiftly as possible. The sponsors will have as much time as needed to present their legislation. Each of our guests are going to be limited to two minutes for their testimony. We have 96 witnesses testifying today, so we ask that you be mindful of the time clock. That will go off at two minutes. With that, colleagues, we are going to start with Senate Bill 798. Senator Ferguson, Mr. President, Declaration of Rights, Right to Reproductive Freedom. If you have a panel, please feel free to bring them forward and we'll get started when you're ready. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the Finance Committee. It is a pleasure to be here with you today on what is the first day of Women's History Month. Uh, and I think that that is an important statement for the bill that we will be hearing today. Uh, Senate Bill uh, 798 enshrines in the state constitution the fundamental right here in Maryland that the decisions between bodily autonomy does, are, are made between a woman and her health care provider. Fundamentally, full stop, that is what this legislation does. It is a value that we in the state of Maryland have demonstrated back in 1991 when there was a fundamental federal protection that still we believe that no matter what happens at the federal level, we in Maryland say the standard that we believe moving forward protects the right of a woman to have bodily autonomy. This past June, um, it was an unthinkable moment of 50 years of legal precedent that uh, Supreme Court justices who had testified that it was legal precedent, uh, that it was uh, to be relied upon, that these rights, that this opinion about uh, the constitutional right, federal right uh, that had been tried in the, uh, the federal constitution was something that would not be jeopardized. And then given the opportunity, that proved not to be true. And so we as the state of Maryland have an obligation and a duty to protect women in this state and protect providers to make sure that bodily autonomy and privacy matter here in the state of Maryland. Uh, what this bill will eventually do, it will put this question to the voters and the, the, uh, the voters in Maryland, the citizens of Maryland will make, I believe the right decision to say that that hard, difficult choice, that independence, that liberty that every person deserves, it is a protected right here in Maryland between a woman and her provider. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I have uh, a panel members who can speak to a number of the details and certainly have done some remarkable work over the years with us. Uh, and if, if I could hand it over to them, uh, to your discretion. Sure. Um, well, good, good afternoon, uh, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klaus Meyer, members of the Senate Finance Committee. Uh, for the record, Baltimore County Executive Johnny Olszewski, proud to be here testifying in full support of Senate Bill 798. I want to thank Senate President Ferguson for his leadership on this issue, as well as many of you uh, who are also supporting this critical legislation. Uh, a constitutional amendment on the ballot for November of 24 to enshrine reproductive rights in Maryland's Constitution. This will allow Maryland voters to send a clear message in the very, very strongest of terms that those seeking safe and legal abortions will be able to continue to do so in Maryland without fear of those seeking um, without fear. Uh, for almost 50 years, Marylanders have been able to count on access to reproductive care, whether it was family planning, health decisions, and opportunities to prepare for their future. These medical decisions have been and should have been made by women in consultation with their doctor and anyone they deemed appropriate to be part of that decision. Unfortunately, as the Senate president indicated, uh, the Roe v. Wade decision set those freedoms back in a big and unfortunate way, so much so that in Baltimore County, uh, we had to partner with our state's attorney to reaffirm that there will not be prosecution or extradition for abortions provided in our jurisdiction. 
Senate Bill 798 simply affirms an individual's fundamental right to their own reproductive liberty and provides that the state may not directly or indirectly abridge that right on behalf of our residents of Baltimore County, those of the state, and for the future of my seven-year-old daughter, I respectfully request your full and enthusiastic support for Senate Bill 798. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Shakia Johnson, and I am here today on behalf of Maryland National Organization for Women. Um, at Maryland Now, we're committed to working towards accessible reproductive health care for all, and we fully support safe and legal abortion because protecting access to abortion effectuates vital constitutional values, including dignity, autonomy, equality, and bodily integrity. Maryland Now supports Senate Bill 798, Declaration of Reproductive Rights, Right to Reproductive Freedom, which recognizes the right to be free from government intrusion into personal life decisions and the right to control one's own body without influence or coercion. Since the Supreme Court's devastating decision to overturn Roe v. Wade stripped Americans of federal abortion protections, an immense urgency in the fight for reproductive health rights and justice persists at the state level. The Supreme Court has made it clear that protecting Americans' right to equitable and autonomous health care is not a priority. However, in Maryland, we have the opportunity to reimagine what is possible for our communities by creating a future that will create a more equitable health care landscape for all. Thanks to the tireless work of advocates and state elected officials, Marylanders have successfully defended reproductive freedoms within our state, but we cannot stop here. A constitutional amendment is the most comprehensive way to ensure Marylanders have the right to a full range of reproductive health care services, no matter where the balance of power lies in our state government. This is our best chance of ensuring future generations have the autonomy to decide what happens to their bodies and when to be, I'm sorry, and when, and to be a safe haven for those seeking reproductive health care from states with their, when their basic liberties have been stripped away by extremist lawmakers. It is for those reasons that Maryland National Organization for Women respectfully urges a favorable report on Senate Bill 795. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Griffith, for having us here. And um, thank you to the Senate President for, um, uh, there you are, <laughs> Senate President, for um, sponsoring this um, very important piece of legislation, Senate Bill 798. Um, I'm Karen Nelson, for the record, CEO of Planned Parenthood of Maryland. And I am here in strong support of Senate Bill 798. Because last year with the Dobbs decision, the U.S. Supreme Court took the unprecedented step of eliminating one of our most fundamental rights, the right of an, inv an individual to make decisions about their own health care by stripping abortion protections that were formerly enshrined in Roe versus Wade. The bill before us here today uh, provides Maryland with the highest level of protection for reproductive freedom. In simplest terms, this bill will ensure that individuals can make their own decisions about abortion, birth control, and continuing a pregnancy. As providers of abortion care, our Planned Parenthood clinicians experience the full gamut of patients making decisions every single day in our health centers. We see all types of patients, young, mature, uh, rich, poor, married, unmarried, those with children, some of these choices are hard, some of them are pro pragmatic, and, so, and some are very emotional. But what they all have in common is that everyone is able to make their own decisions about their future and their decisions to prevent a pregnancy or to remain pregnant. Many of us think that Maryland is a safe state and that we're immune from the impact of Rose overturned. But the truth is, we do need this bill. We need this to create a legal buffer um, when you are being stripped of the many layers of, of protection that we, and especially the one that we just saw with the fall of Roe. So we urge uh, a favorable, favorable uh, uh, comeback on this. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Michelle Siri. Happy Women's History Month. I am the Executive Director of the Women's Law Center of Maryland. I'm also here on behalf of the Maryland Legislative Agenda for Women, MLAW. Now, I'm here today in full support of Senate Bill 798. I'm going to take a second to thank President Ferguson 
for his uh, his leadership on this. It means a great deal to all of us here and also to my own county executive, Johnny O, for being here. That means a lot to me personally as a Baltimore County resident. Now, in June of 2022, the Supreme Court issued its radical decision in Dobbs, overturning nearly 50 years of legal precedence and protection when it came to abortion care. And among the many arguments that were contained in that decision was a position that because reproductive freedom wasn't a part of our nation's laws at the time of the 14th Amendment's passage, those rights can't exist within our constitutional framework today. But of course, there were a lot of other things that weren't a part of our nation's fabric at that time. The right to vote for African Americans wouldn't come for two more years. The right for women to vote wouldn't happen for another 52 years. The right for a woman to not be raped by her husband wouldn't happen for another 100 plus years. So that means that this decision was made about us, but not with us. It was based upon a body politic that excluded so many citizens. And that cannot be allowed to be the case here in Maryland. The Dobbs court made very clear that the issue of abortion rights must be sent back to the states. And now we are here calling upon the legislature to pave the way to do just that. We want to ensure reproductive freedom for generations to come. We must act definitively and explicitly. Constitutional amendment is our strongest protection to ensure meaningful access. And by doing so and using a strict scrutiny standard, we're ensuring that that right to reproductive liberty is explicit. So I've said it before. I will continue to say it. It is no longer enough for us to be just pro-choice. For all those reasons, we must guarantee the fundamental right today for future generations to come. And I urge a favorable report. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much for your testimony. Senator Reedy has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. President, um, I listened to the presentation today from you and all and all of the folks on the panel. I just want to maybe clarify a couple of things. Would, would you acknowledge that current law in Maryland already allows for abortion procedures to take place up until birth with no real restrictions? I wouldn't say that that is the exact case today. I think that uh, there are protections between uh, the 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 choice between a woman and her provider under current statutory law today. Uh, what this will be is a constitutional amendment that provides a test for any future legislation uh, that could come through the body. Uh, and this gives Marylanders the opportunity, if we believe in freedom and liberty between for a woman and uh, and her own bodily choices. So if that's the case, this constitutional amendment won't strike down any of our current laws? It will not. It, this would not strike down any current laws. There's no repeal of any uh, of any current laws. Because we're not at this point, our laws are not getting in between this choice, this decision. I, I can't speak for any uh, individual, any individual woman who has tried to face. I know that you know we took up last year the Abortion Access Act for the first time really in 30 years of, of having the opportunity to make sure that we had a sufficient uh, number of services and that we treated uh, women who were on Medicaid similarly to how private uh, private insurance providers uh, handle um, abortion services and you know which I think was absolutely the, the right way to go and I think was um, uh, incredibly important for last year. This is really about a value for Marylanders moving forward and sort of who we are as Marylanders and whether or not we give Marylanders the opportunity to uh, let voters vote to say whether or not the right to privacy between a medical provider and a woman is something that we should protect in our state constitution. I appreciate the answer. So basically what we're saying with this constitutional amendment is that there really is any 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 kinds of restrictions on an abortive procedure at any time during the pregnancy up till birth really is extreme and the wrong choice, correct? I, I don't think that's what the, the amendment says. I think it should be uh, that the state's interest should be should be uh, a should not be this per, this right to liberty and freedom should not be abridged, but for a compelling state interest achieved by the least restrictive means. So what? So then, you could still pass a bill that would restrict late term abortions, which we don't currently really restrict in Maryland at all. But we could. Um, there's a very very big loophole for getting a late term abortion. So we this constitutional amendment would. You could still pass a bill restricting late term abortions because you could show a compelling interest. I mean, I, I don't know any. There's plenty of hypotheticals that we could talk through. I, I would say what this amendment would do would say that there could not be a restriction of the the, the right to freedom and liberty between a, uh, a an individual and her health care provider unless there was a compelling government interest and it was the least restrictive means possible. 
Okay, and I'll, I'll just one one more follow up, Madam Madam Chair, with 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 the, the senator on this one. Um, by I guess my 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 question that comes to me when we talk about this issue, putting aside how different ones of us may feel on what our position is on the on the overall issue of of abortion, by placing this in the state constitution, that this doesn't this limit us to, based on new science and discovery. If we discover that, like for example, I think the old fashioned term on the other side of this issue was safe, legal, and rare. And we've come a long way from that. <laughs> we, we actually are like rolling out the welcome wagon. We want to make it like an industry here in Maryland is the way we've acted in recent, in the last, especially last, the last year. I'm concerned that you put in the constitution, you can't, if you've discovered that a particular procedure is not really healthy or is more dangerous to the woman or, or whatever, that you're really saying that the arguments can be well that would restrict access, right? Or, or are you saying that we, there would still be opportunities for us to, if we discovered that something was not safe, we could make the change, even if this is in the constitution? I mean, I think the constitutional right is protected by a compelling government and uh, a compelling government interest that is the least restrictive means. But I think let me step back for just a half second here and why this is is, is so important. And you know, I, the, the nitty gritty absolutely matters, and we'll have plenty of debate on that moving forward. Um, on June fourteenth, when the when the Dobbs case came out. Um, I will never know the challenge it is to try, you know, I, can, I, I can't even fathom the challenge of any woman who has had to seek abortion services and the, and the, and the mental anguish that can come in, in facing that choice and that conversation with, with, her, uh, with the, her medical provider. Um, but on June 14th, I was at home when the case came out, and there had certainly been leaks that this was possible. Um, I'll never forget the moment walking down the stairs and seeing my wife in tears. And what she said was not specific. She wasn't seeking abortion services. What she said is, why do we always have to fight so hard for equality? That's what she said. That was her reaction. And I think what today is about is saying that here in Maryland, we believe that every individual's right to freedom and privacy matters. And I think that's what this is about. And, and Madam Chair, I know I said last question, this is one small follow up. Could we, would there be opening to an amendment to, to make it clear that the compelling interest would include safety of women as it as it as it relates to the to the regulation of, of medical clinics that perform abortions. I, look, I, I think the language is sufficient as it exists today. And I think um, throughout throughout uh, our, 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 our country's history, the courts have been a place where uh, factual patterns are, are worked out. And I think compelling interests, uh, the standard is correct as it or is appropriate as it is. Thank now. you, Madam Chair. I, I, I just my my con my concern, and I've heard it expressed by other folks, not the Senate president, about that somehow believing there should be any sort of safeguard on abortion at any stage is somehow extreme, which I reject. But I do appreciate the answers to the questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hershey. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. President, um, obviously last year, the legislature passed the Abortion uh, Care Act. Um, my question regarding this constitutional amendment if the voters were to not approve this amendment, what happens? What's different? Why is this necessary? This is really a protection about the values of who we are as Marylanders since the Dobbs decision left it in the hands of the states to determine uh, what freedom looks like between a woman and her and her healthcare practitioner. Uh, and so um, the we are here every year passing laws by having a constitutional protection and ensures that there is an appropriate value based test about protecting liberty and freedom here in the state of Maryland that any future legislature uh, would have to uh, make sure that they are complying by that important, important, compelling interest, least restrictive means test. Um, understand, but we pass a lot of pieces of legislation. We don't put everything into the Constitution. In fact, we have uh, rights that are in the United States Constitution and they're challenged in the committee rooms of, of this legislature all the time. What constitutes an important constitutional amendment as opposed to a constitutional amendment that, that can be challenged? Well, I'd say this was a constitutional amendment. This was a constitutional right for 50 years. It was established precedent. It was the, the, the rules of the road for 50 years in the United States until um, a majority of nine individuals uh, made a, a different selection and said that the state's have to define that constitutional right. And so I think that's what we're doing here today is that in June, when that decision was made and redefined 50 years of judicial precedent, uh, what we are doing right now is saying that here in Maryland, we believe that those 50 years of judicial precedent were right. And that in our state constitution, we believe that that's how we should approach this moving forward and that liberty and freedom matter. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Ms. Nelson, you mentioned legal buffer, that this provides a legal buffer. What does that mean? I guess what I was referring to was that um, it, to, to tack on what the um, what President Ferguson just said, because we um, lost the constitutional right with the with the Dobbs decision and the decision making goes back to the states that this provides that um, layer of protection for abortion care in the state of Maryland. Meaning the the legislation that we passed. So I'm going back to legislation we passed last year was not enough. The legislation that we passed last year had to do with access and um, uh, provided um, uh, additional access to the work that we're already doing. Um, this is uh, the best way that we're going to protect abortion rights here in the state of Maryland by enshrining it in the state's constitution. Okay, thank you. And Ms. Siri, there's been a, a lot of comments about the rights of a woman, and, and that was mentioned today, that, but the, the actual amendment says that every person um, has a central com uh, as a central component to an individual's right. So we, we haven't necessarily designated woman. So my, my concern is in the, in the case that a couple conceives a child together, does this Bill then give the father any type of legal standing to advance his or his interest in the life of the unborn child? Thank you, Senator. This language is very intentional because we want to recognize, and, and I was actually one of the last folks to testify last night here in this committee late into the night. I want to thank you all for staying so late last night on the trans health equity bill. And we wanted to recognize that there are people who will become pregnant that may not identify as women. And that is what that language is referring to. But it is very specific that it discusses one's own pregnancy. So not your partner's pregnancy, not the other person that was involved in that pregnancy, but it is one's own pregnancy. Understand. I see that. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I don't see any further questions for the sponsor or the panel. Thank you all very much for your testimony. We're going to call forward the next group of names. Uh, Jody Finkelstein, Lisa Jordan, Bob Spear, Ashley Esposito, Okay, you can get started as soon as you're ready. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. I'm Lisa Jordan with the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault, the coalition of the rape crisis centers across the state of Maryland. Thank you, Mr. President, for your leadership um, on Senate Bill 798 about reproductive liberty. I'm here to ask the committee to remember that access to abortion care and reproductive liberty are vital to survivors of rape. The CDC reports that almost 3 million women in the US experienced rape-related pregnancy during their lifetime. A three-year study of rape-related pregnancy showed that 5% of rape victims of reproductive age, so that's 12 to 45, became pregnant as a result of rape, with the majority of those pregnancies in adolescence. Of these, half terminated the pregnancy and about a third kept the child each of these reproductive choices should be protected by our constitution. Survivors of reproductive coercion also need access to abortion care and reproductive liberty. And re reproductive coercion is a form of intimate partner violence where a woman's partner tries to control reproductive decisions by uh, preventing access or tampering with birth control or forcing intercourse with the purpose of causing pregnancy. Of women who were raped by an intimate partner, 30% experienced a form of reproductive coercion by that same partner. These survivors need access to reproductive liberty. And finally, let's be very clear. Legal exceptions for rape survivors are not a solution. Laws should not require that a survivor disclose sexual assault or reproductive coercion in order to receive abortion care. It's just incorrect to assume that all healthcare providers are going to be supportive. Survivors should be free to choose whom to confide in and when to disclose assault, and a constitutional right to reproductive liberty will help protect these survivors' choices. For these reasons, the Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Assault urges the Finance Committee to report favorably on Senate Bill 798.
Hello, Chairman Griffith and members of the committee. My name is Bob Spear. I'm a resident of Garrett County, Swanton, Maryland, and grandfather to five amazing young women who are fierce advocates for autonomy over their own bodies and their own reproductive freedoms. To support them and young people in my rural community, I am an active member in MARF, the Mountain Maryland Alliance for Reproductive Freedom, a nonpartisan organization of Allegheny and Garrett Countyans committed to assuring reproductive health care to residents in Mountain Maryland. A large and growing constituency in Western Maryland understands that reproductive health care, including education, family planning, contraception, and abortion, must be readily accessible and affordable for all. We all know that lack of access to reproductive health care harms young people and families, and that the freedom to make reproductive health care decisions can be eliminated entirely as our neighbors in nearby West Virginia have experienced. Maryland voters upheld our current pro-choice abortion law in a referendum in 1992. Because of Dobbs, we now need to put abortion rights into our Maryland constitution, but we must go further and protect all reproductive rights, not only abortion, to safeguard against future adverse court decisions. Consider this, the Comstock Act of 1873 banned the distribution of contraceptives and information about birth control. The Supreme Court ended Comstock in, 18, in 1965 when it ruled in Griswold versus Connecticut that the constitutional right to privacy allowed married couples to use birth control. But Justice Clarence Thomas has written that Griswold should be reconsidered. Another reason Maryland needs to protect all abortion rights. MARF joins the many other Maryland organizations and citizens who support SB 798. We urge this committee to do the same. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jody Finkelstein, and I'm the executive director for the Montgomery County Commission for Women. One of our wonderful commissioners, Liz Richards, has submitted written testimony on behalf of the commission. Unfortunately, County Executive Mark Elrich couldn't be here today, but he is in absolute full support of this bill and committed to ensuring that women receive access to all reproductive services available to them, including abortion. In fact, the county appropriated $1 million in grants to assist service providers in Montgomery County that offer the full range of reproductive services to women. The county will continue to support women's reproductive freedoms and supporting this bill is an absolutely crucial part of this. This is, bill is important for numerous reasons, but particularly important to me, as I have known many women who have made difficult decisions when facing an unintended pregnancy. My first time discussing reproductive freedom was actually in high school, when I had two different friends at two different times face unintended pregnancies. One friend chose to have an abortion, while the other friend chose to have a member of her family adopt the child until she was ready to become a parent herself. Today, both friends are doing exceptionally well and are mothers and part of families to wonderful children. I share this example because it demonstrates how two different individuals, when faced with the same choice, made the decision that was ultimately right for them. They were supported by their families, their friends, and the laws in Maryland. This is what I call reproductive freedom and why Senate Bill 796 is so critically, critically important to so many in our state. Thank you again for your time and I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 798. Hi, my name is Ashley Esposito and I live in Baltimore City and my story is a story of reproductive freedom. It almost wasn't, which is why I strongly support SB 798 to take the first step to establish reproductive rights as a constitutionally protected right in Maryland. I almost didn't have access to an abortion in Maryland or access to abortion in Maryland is neither without is neither equal or nor without obstacles. In 2017, I was about to hit the send button on my baby shower invitation when I got the worst news of my life. We went in for our anatomy scan and the medical staff were silent. After some more silence, they told us the prognosis is poor. Our baby didn't have any amniotic fluid and they didn't have any kidneys and were missing other parts of their vital parts of their urinary tract system. Every breath I took was crushing this pregnancy. I wanted so I wanted this pregnancy so badly and as a mom I knew what was best. I also know without access to reproductive care I would have been traumatized and taken and likely taken my own life. 
the minute the prognosis was poor, politics entered my room and I did not sign a consent form for politicians to make decisions for me. Immediately there was, a, was tension among the hospital staff. We were already past 20 weeks and that hospital did not provide care after 20 weeks. We needed a referral and referrals take time, making appointments takes time. And at the time there was no providers in Maryland who offered care past 24 weeks and we barely got an appointment. I ended up needing a second abortion in 2018, but I chose a different type of abortion. Like many families in the state, we found out that we carry a, a deadly genetic disease. And for genetic carriers like me, if we wanna have a healthy pregnancy to term, the new science is in vitro fertilization and our only pathway to have a baby to bring home. That's how my husband and I finally had a successful pregnancy and why we are the parent of my beautiful son named Vinny today. From the, from the first horrible news I received back in 2017 to the wonderful news when I interact with my son, it's essential for people like me and all Marylanders to have reproductive freedom because, as a constitutional right. Please support this bill. Okay, thank you very much for sharing your testimony and your experiences with the committee. I don't see any questions for this panel, so thank you all very much. We're going to call the next group forward, and this uh, the next couple of groups that I will call are signed up in opposition to the bill. Jonathan Alexander, Laura Bogley, Kristen Holt, Jennifer Velhusen, Benjamin Sisney, and Francis Arlingas. Good afternoon, and you can get started when you are ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senate President. I am Jonathan Alexander. I am an attorney and counsel for the Maryland Family Institute, and we strongly oppose this abortion amendment through Senate Bill 798. But just like in slavery and just like in segregation, abortion remains one of the most immoral actions that can be done to any person. Part of the text of this bill talks about the individual's right to liberty and equality. But what should be included here is that babies are individuals and that they are owed a right to live. That should be the discussion. How do we create an environment for more lives in this free state and not use the constitution of this state as a tool to destroy more lives? Maryland will not always have abortion. It can't because no lie can live forever. There will be an end to abortion. And so for the lives born into these difficult situations, we ought to streamline the adoption process or encourage participation in foster care systems. For the babies still in the womb, we ought to allow mothers to view ultrasounds, get an image of the heartbeat of the child. We ought to expand prenatal, perinatal, and maternal care. So mothers are more confident and see a range of life-preserving care for them and their child. You know, we're no longer living in a time where we can claim that we do not know or be unaware of what happens in a womb and with the life of a baby. We can love that child and we can love the mother carrying that child. But this proposal to the Maryland Constitution goes in the exact opposite direction. It co-signs us to a practice where scalpels, vacuums, and chemical pills starve and rip apart babies within the womb expelling them to writhe in pain. That abortion practice has no place in our laws. It has no place in our state, and it certainly has no place in Maryland's constitution. For those reasons, I ask that you issue an unfavorable report to Senate Bill 798. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Laura Bogley, and on behalf of the Board of Directors of Maryland Right to Life, I speak in defense of the Constitution of the state of Maryland and the unalienable right to life which it defends uh, and guarantees for all born and preborn. This bill is about fulfilling campaign promises to a bloodthirsty abortion industry. But each of you already has made a promise in swearing your oath of office to defend the Constitution, which guarantees the unalienable right to life. Women in Maryland have a statutory right to abortion for any reason through birth, including rape, incest, fetal anomalies, 
And there are no penalties against women seeking abortion or medical, medical intervention in the case of pregnancy complications like ectopic pregnancy or miscarriage. Recent radical abortion enactments of the General Assembly have completely removed abortion from the spectrum of healthcare, and poor women aren't even given access to a licensed physician. Maryland has become a state sponsor of the abortion industry. The state is using taxpayer funding to establish a monopoly of the deadly abortion empire over women's health. This bill empowers the state to weaponize our state constitution and to use the full force of state government to silence opposition and squeeze out any pro-life competition to the abortion empire's death on demand agenda. This bill will actually have the effect of limiting a person's reproductive choices. 64% or nearly two out of three women say they did not choose their abortion, but they felt they had no other choice. If the state really trusts women to choose, then you must give women access to life-saving alternatives to abortion that this bill seeks to eliminate. After nearly 50 years and 64 million human lives lost under federal abortion mandates, abortion has failed to end childhood poverty, prevent unplanned pregnancies, or cure any of the socioeconomic ills facing women and raising their families. The Maryland General Assembly has a once in a lifetime opportunity to course correct and prior prioritize public funding for services that empower women of all socioeconomic groups to choose life for their children. We urge your unfavorable report. Thank you. I'm Jen Beltizen. I'm a women's health physician and a former military sexual assault medical forensic examiner. Um, I'm asking you to vote no because the overbroad language in this bill protects pharmaceutical companies seeking deregulation at the expense of women's safety. This isn't about pro-life or pro-choice. No European nation has such broad allowances for abortion. In fact, 75% of the world doesn't. Why? Because these abortions increase risk of ectopic pregnancy Placenta previa, placenta accreta. I've attached 25 studies to my written testimony, including a prominent Howard University study demonstrating a 4.7 times increase in breast cancer in black women. And this amendment would allow even the most outdated procedures that increase risk of amniotic fluid embolism, which can cause instant death. I had a patient come to my ICU who hit her head because she was in so much pain after her pill abortion. She took all of her pain pills and got drunk. Um, this bill protects the pocketbook of the provider who told her it was just going to be like a period, and then she bled out two points of hemoglobin. He didn't even do a basic mental health check and did the abortion on the anniversary of her brother's suicide by hanging because he saw her as a $300 opportunity, not as a person. This bill protects the boyfriend who said he didn't want her baby. It protects the employer, the command team, who told her, oh, it's too bad that you got pregnant because we were going to promote you. This bill protects society from providing for the real financial, mental health, and employment equality needs of women because its language is too broad. What's tragic is every person along the way thought they were doing good for my patient, just like the people who are putting forward this amendment. But she ended up on her hands and knees at 2 a.m. looking for the baby she wanted in the products of conception. She's going to remember that for the rest of her life. I'm going to remember that for the rest of my life. And she wept for her baby, but I weep for her. And so I ask that you correct language that is going to allow the pharmaceutical industry to profit from our pain. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Very weepy. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair. Madam Vice Chair, distinguished members, my name is Ben Sisney. I'm an attorney with the American Center for Law and Justice. Um, I'm here on behalf of the ACLJ, over 200,000 concerned Americans, including I think nearly 3,000 who signed on here in Maryland uh, in op opposition to this bill. Um, obviously, abortion is a moral and political debate, um, a legal debate, scientific debate. Um, for a number of years, um, the Supreme Court, in my view, correctly held um, uh, that there was not a constitutional right. Uh, everybody understands what happens in the Dobbs opinion, I think. Well, actually, I don't know if everybody understands because I'm hearing that this bill uh, is necessary because of Dobbs, because Dobbs overturned Roe. We, we've done a legal analysis, but it's actually common sense if you understand what Roe was in, in Casey versus Planned Parenthood. All of Maryland's laws governing abortion are still in the books. They survived Roe. They survived Casey. Everything on Maryland's books stays in place. The overturning of Roe does nothing to that. If Maryland decided to go a different direction, 
that's up to the distinguished members of this committee and the legislature and the constituents. If Maryland wants to add this extreme bill to its constitution, I urge you not to do it under the guise that this goes back to Roe or that Dobbs made this necessary. This has nothing to do with Roe. This is so far beyond Roe. I heard at the committee last week before the House um, uh, testimony that this would actually allow late-term abortion up to birth of a healthy baby. And, and they weren't open to an amendment. It's not tied to viability at all. This is not going back to Roe, and we respectfully request that you report this bill unfavorably. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Senate President. My colleagues and I are here with Christians Advocating for Life in Annapolis. We represent a multicultural Christian ministry leaders movement of over 200 churches and thousands of constituents in the DMV and Baltimore areas. In written testimony we submitted, participating organizations are noted. Seven written testimonies were submitted today. Our ministry leaders support families affected by crisis pregnancies and those who have had abortions. I'm Dr. Kristen Holt. I'm a hospital pharmacist with a background in health policy from Harvard School of Public Health. I'm a mom and a faith community leader. We're grateful for your leadership to promote health, and we believe that Senate Bill 798 is counterproductive. This bill codifies a belief that abortion should flourish with the least restrictive boundaries, and we believe that what should flourish most is our relationship to our creator, the whole person, and the community. We disagree with Senate Bill 798 on the basis of boundaries. Scientifically, boundaries do exist. In utero, medical practice differentiates a fetus from the mom because it's not her genetic code, it's unique. Secondly, we hold a biblical worldview embedded into our nation's founding documents. All men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator. If I'm not the creator of the person, when they are within my boundaries, it does not negate whether they are a person. The Bible values life from womb onward and restricts taking life. Third, we do need industry boundaries to protect vulnerable women and children, as you've heard. In 2021, Maryland Medicaid reported 500 abortions were deemed medically necessary and over 9,000 were elective. We've heard from parishioners who felt pressured into abortion by the industry, partners, or economics with lasting regret. At times, lasting physical and mental health impact was medically verified as is in the written testimony we submitted from Ms. Winterton. Informed consent improvements would be impossible with this bill. National statistics also show abortion disproportionately impacts African-American women. Lastly, the child never has the opportunity to give informed consent. Senate Bill 798 invokes irreversible consequences to people and the state for not recognizing these boundaries. Thank you for opposing Senate Bill 798. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, Senate President, distinguished senators. My name is Dr. Frank Arlinghouse. I'm not a physician. I'm just a private citizen with a wife and three daughters and some of their friends dressed in red in the audience who uh, oppose this bill. I ask you to oppose this due to the extreme nature of the bill. In particular, amending the Maryland Constitution is an unusual extreme measure. This bill takes a more extreme position than current Maryland law, which was unaffected by Dobbs. This restricts the legislature's opportunities to pass reasonable restrictions on abortion in late pregnancy or to restrict it otherwise as other health care is. We already have extreme abortion laws compared to other states, but this bill would prevent the state from reasonable regulations. The consequences include elective abortions for all nine months paid for by the state and removes your ability to enact reasonable regulation without repealing or amending the Constitution again. It can... <clears throat> It can be reasonably interpreted to prevent any action on your part, as uh, Senator Reedy referred to in his questions, uh, to limit abortion of a viable or late-term fetus, to limit state funding of abortions, to enact, or to enact any number of reasonable restrictions. And I'll mention one of those as the father of three daughters. When my daughter was 18 years old and in a Howard County High School recovering from ACL surgery, she was not allowed to self-administer aspirin. She was not allowed to have the school nurse give her an aspirin. She needed my consent and she needed the consent of her doctor. On the other hand, her 13-year-old sister could go get an abortion and we wouldn't have known about it unless there was a complication. Um, it was between her and the abortion provider. So when we say this is about women, um, uh, we're forgetting that we're, we're taking an extreme position already in Maryland on abortion and we're not regulating it as we would other healthcare because there are lots of things my daughters could not do as teenagers 
unless it was an abortion. By removing the legislator's ability, legislature's ability to act, you abandon your responsibility to consider the, these re regulations and you inject the court further into things. This is why I ask you to return an unfavorable report on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I think we heard from everyone on the panel. So we'll go to Senator Reedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Bill, is it Bill Husen? Is that how you pronounce your last name? Yes, sir. I was looking through, I was looking through everybody's testimony. I was looking through yours here. I, I appreciate the studies that you've included on some of this. Could you just talk for a moment, because you've treated women, I mean, can you, that, that are in these kind of situations, can you talk for a moment about, you, you talked about coercion and about when we talk about being pro-choice, right? The idea is that there's a choice. Can you just talk a little bit about what, what you're seeing? Because it seems to me that um, we're trying to protect women with a constitutional amendment, but we may be missing some things about protecting women. Yes, sir. The majority of my post-abortive women uh, reported to me that they regretted their abortion and that they felt that they had been pushed into it. Two of them did not. Those were, one of them was a 18 year old with um, some significant uh, personality deviation. And the second one was a rape victim. I've referred for abortion before, as I pointed out, this is not a pro-life or pro-choice issue. It's the issue of now you're protecting pharmaceutical companies and corporations. You had a corporation CEO come and testify. That's different than protecting women and women's choices. It's, it's fair to say that a, a chemical abortion is not, um, it's not a quick or easy solution, correct? I mean, it, it, it's, it can be very traumatic if, not, if you don't have the proper care. It, it, for example, if you ha are not under a doctor's care, would it be wise to refer someone who's not a doctor and not going to observe the patient to be referring for chemical abortions? And that's a strong question because we usually consider chemical abortions to be safer even than delivering a baby. However, um, as in the case of the patient that I mentioned, sometimes they can be incredibly traumatic. And in this case, she had a doctor, but that doctor didn't bother did, because there's not regulation in place in that, in that case. Doctor didn't bother to perform his due diligence. Now you're talking about um, mailing pharmaceutical pills to people's homes without a doctor's evaluation, that's, uh, which I think is what you're asking about. Yeah, I mean, shouldn't a doctor look at somebody before, I mean. Absolutely. Um, in fact, I strongly believe based on the, based on the studies that I submitted discussing ectopic pregnancy, that women should also have access to ultrasounds. More science is always more better, right? <laughs> we want to have, we want to be able to make a completely informed choice. And if you can't have an ultrasound before even a pill abortion, you can't know if, what if this is an ectopic? If this is an ectopic, you should be giving methotrexate, not mifepristone and misopristol. Okay, okay, thank you. I mean, in our state, we now are gonna allow nurse practitioners, nurses, midwives to perform abortions. I, I assume they would also be able to prescribe medical pill, medical abortion pills. So there'd be that concern you would have as a, as a clinician. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Mounds. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. I apologize for being late. I had a couple of bill hearings and some other committees, and I apologize. I missed some of the testimony earlier, so I hope I'm not asking a question that's already been discussed. But in reading the language, and this has been brought up to me um, um, regarding um, uh, the, the way this is written, it, it uses the word every person, and we're talking about reproduct, reproductive rights. And I don't know, I know this is the opposition panel, um, so you've been critically reviewing the, 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 the bill. Um, how, how does that, do the, what are the concerns over the dynamics, if enacted and put into place, this would create for uh, the father and the mother when you're talking about reproductive rights, because most of the discussion that, and I'm late, I'm sorry, I'm missing the test. Most of the discussion has been, been focused on the, on the mother, but wouldn't the language, the way it's uh, written, create a new dynamic, um, bringing the father into um, um, a lot of this that we're, we're talking about right now? Have, have you looked at the language in, in that regard? For, for any of the panelists. 
Senator Motz, if you don't, if you don't mind, I'll take that question. Um, according to the bill proponents, uh, they addressed the question that was originally asked by Senator Reedy, I believe, uh, that said the word persons does not convey that this would extend a right to biological fathers, uh, but instead that was intended to support um, unlimited uh, or unregulated um, use of assisted reproductive technologies, which was apparently uh, a primary interest for people in the transgender community. So the word persons, they said, would be uh, designate um, a biological woman who would become a, a, trans, a trans man um, who uh, is pregnant um, or would like to become pregnant and want to use ass assisted technologies. But to be clear, because it is a fundamental right that is establishing that may not be infringed or limited, that means it would limit the legislature's ability to regulate uh, fertility clinics and assisted reproductive technologies, which I think should be a concern to all of you. Thank you. And does anybody else want to comment on that? Sure. Sure, I can comment on the, the straightforward question. Should fathers be involved in the decision of bringing life into the world? And the answer is yes, fathers are already involved in uh, contributing to conception. So absolutely, fathers do have a place. Uh, the primary place of a father is to protect, is to protect the life in the womb. You know, I come from Charles County, a majority black county, and it's indicative of not just the county, but the state and really nationwide where African-Americans uh, make up about 12 to 15% of the population, but contribute to over 40% of the abortions. So a vast disproportionate a uh, vast disproportionate amount of abortions are committed against black babies. Uh, and so we are looking for a whole life uh, result to this, having fathers be more involved, not have them have the coercive approach uh, to a woman in a pregnant situation, but providing the care and the support that a woman uh, will need and can look to a father to provide if he's there in the picture. Um, and you asked why the numbers are so big in the African-American community. Just look at Margaret Sanger's words. She was the founder of Planned Parenthood. She started Planned Parenthood. And when asked, she says, I don't want, quote, word to go out that we are trying to exterminate the Negro population. She was a eugenicist. She was a racist. She didn't like black folks. She started Planned Parenthood. And you see the results. Over 80% of Planned Parenthoods are in majority black and brown neighborhoods. Um, so. And, and, and many of the issues that I deal with um, um, on abortion and reproductive rights, things like that, are situations. Um, they're uh, very emotional, very personal situations. And the occasion where it comes up with um, um, young young individuals, um, the uh, question of information comes up often. You know, if information is key, making a decision. What what does the person? What's going? What are they thinking when they're when they're making these reproductive? <laughs> rights decisions so that's how we want to describe it and and the way i uh, the way i read um this amendment is that any requirement to uh for um notice or provide information things like that for children if this were to become law that would be an infringement on that on 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 these new rights is am i interpreting am i interpreting this correctly or Thank you, Senator. If I may respond uh, to that, um, yeah, I think I think you are interpreting that correctly. And I, I to 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 drive the point home to to make clear. So this is imposing strict scrutiny on any regulation, not just like a prohibition, but anything that limits abortion at any stage for any reason or no reason at all. This would impose strict scrutiny. Any lawyer in here understands strict scrutiny in constitutional law. Laws that survive strict scrutiny and legal challenges are few and far between. Strict scrutiny is the highest, heaviest standard. And, and laws that, that are challenged, and, and we don't know how far what this amendment will do because it will be up to the courts to apply strict scrutiny to anything the legislature does that, that in any way impacts abortion. It will be up to the courts. That's strict scrutiny, right. and it likely won't survive. I also have an answer for that from the human trafficking perspective when you're talking about youth. Um, I started the first human trafficking program for medical students um, in Puerto Rico. And it, while working on that, did a lot of research on human trafficking in general. And unfortunately, Maryland is a hub for human trafficking. Um, again, this is not about pro-life or pro-choice, 
this bill is so overreaching that it's going to be very difficult to put in restrictions for human traffickers and pimps bringing underage folks to go and get abortions. This The language is so overreaching. In fact, it even says in the bill, if it's in the government's interest to regulate. But we're not talking about the government's interest. We're talking about real women and trans men who need their interests. So this language is also going to further restrict any kind of protection for human trafficking as well. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and your responses. There are no additional questions from the committee. So we're going to call forward our next panel, which is Kathy Kelly, Jennifer Brown, Juan Killingsworth, John Roswell, Brian Barnwell, Deborah Bricado. I think I messed up at least one of those names, so please forgive me. Did I end up with, okay, if I only have five, then we'll call Danielle Pimento. Hey, good afternoon. You can begin. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Danielle Pimentel, and I serve as policy counsel at Americans United for Life. And today I urge this committee to oppose this bill because it authorizes elective abortion on demand up until a baby's birth date, which not only will subject women to the life-threatening harms of abortion and maternal death, but it also greatly limits Maryland's ability from enacting any future health and safety protections for women and, and young girls and infringes on parental rights. Um, the passage of this bill will result in grave harm to women because it subjects them to higher risks of health complications and maternal deaths. It's undisputed that abortion poses grave risks to women and the risks of those harms increasingly um, increases substantially at later gestational ages. As one example, after eight weeks gestation, the relative risks of mortality increases by 38% for each additional week. This bill, in effect, will result in more women um, suffering life-threatening complications and even death, and because it allows them to have abortions up until their baby's birth date. Additionally, the bill would allow elective abortions, um, because the bill allows elective abortions up until a baby's birth date, it also leaves unborn babies who can experience pain from abortion completely unprotected. The state of Maryland has a legitimate interest in mitigating fetal pain. And as we know, scientists have found evidence of fetal pain as early as 12 weeks gestation. So rather than subjecting these preborn infants to pain and the trauma of abortion, the state should be trying to minimize fetal pain as much as possible in furtherance of their interest to do so, which this bill does not do. Another concerning factor about this bill, which you've heard from many other um, people today, is that it will prevent Maryland from enacting common sense protections for women, including um, parental involvement laws, informed consent laws, all of these laws that would protect the health and safety of women and young girls. It will also lower the professional accountability for proportion of provi abortion providers because it will likely result in the prohibition of any regulation of abortion <coughs> providers and facility, um, which will allow them to operate freely without any regulation and oversight. Um, and I'll end with this, the women of Maryland deserve better, the unborn deserve better, and Maryland has legitimate interest to protect maternal health and uh, prenatal life and can do so by opposing this bill today. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kathy Kelly, and I am an aunt of the now Senator Ariana Kelly, who was a co-sponsor of the House version of this bill. I am also director of Democrats for Life of Maryland. Democrats for Life is grateful for Ariana Kelly's attention to issues impacting women in the workforce, especially affordable childcare. But I must stand firmly against SB 798. Along with many other pro-life Democrats in our state and nation, I stand against legislative acts of abortion extremism, including the attempt to enshrine abortion in our state constitution. This action is a threat to the conscience rights of medical professionals and medical institutions, and it poses threats to pro-life freedom of speech, including the right to introduce future legislation restricting abortion, such as partial birth abortion bans, or measures to protect the safety of women from unregulated, unrestricted abortion. 
As a Montgomery County resident, I already pay for abortion at all three levels of government, through federal government grants to Planned Parenthood, through state funding for training of non-physician abortion providers through the Abortion Care Access Act, and lately through my county's supplemental appropriation of $1 million to abortion providers. Also, the Maryland DOH has recently proposed putting an additional $11 million into Medicaid abortions. But SB 798, by declaring abortion a fundamental right, would result in even more funding of abortion over time, despite strong taxpayer opposition to the violence of abortion. Where is the balance on this issue? Where is the concern about Maryland's high abortion rate as reported in Guttmacher data? Maryland is one of only a handful of states which neglects to report abortion data to the CDC, and it now protects abortions, abortionists from civil and criminal liability through the Abortion Care Access Act. Where is the attention to and funding for substantive pregnancy, such as grants for pro-life pregnancy centers? Please do not associate your names with this death knell for conscience rights in Maryland and vote no on the euphemistically named Reproductive Liberty Bill. Thank you. Honorable Chair, members of the Senate Finance Committee, my name is Jennifer Brown. I'm a mother, a political science instructor holding a master's in government from Johns Hopkins University, and I'm previously a legislative aide here in the House. I join my testimony with Christians advocating for life. Um, we have thousands of members, uh, multicultural and nonpartisan Christian leaders across the state. I am also a survivor of domestic violence, which is why I speak, you to, speak to you today. Um, throughout my marriage, I experienced all forms of domestic violence, and I think we can all agree here that no person uh, should experience violence at the hands of another. No one should have their body broken, their voice eliminated, yet that is exactly what SB 798 will enshrine in our state constitution forever. The fetus, or Latin for baby, is an entirely separate and unique life, a special life a precious life. Regardless of what terminology may be used to dehumanize the unborn, it is the same thing that my husband did to me. He believed that because he had a right to treat me the way he did, I no longer had any rights at all. We have never passed an amendment like this that would make it a fundamental right to take life, but that's exactly what we're doing here today. While reviewing last year's testimony from Maryland Coalition Against Sexual Abuse and Maryland Network Against Domestic Violence, I was stunned that each presumes to speak for all women who have experienced domestic violence. The testimony implied that all victims support a pro-abortion stance. The testimony also used nationwide figures drawn from over two decades to make the figures appear larger than they are. According to Maryland Medicaid figures uh, cited in my table one, there were only two abortions that were rape related in 2021. Clearly this figure is neither the impetus nor the justification for this constitutional amendment. To set the record straight, many abused women believe as I do. And so I urge you to please vote against Senate Bill 798. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Sean Roswell. I am part of the Baltimore Sidewalk Advocates for Life, and I have several pictures I want to show. This is a picture of Planned Parenthood on Howard Street. It's self-explanatory. It's in my written testimony. This is a picture of across the street from Planned Parenthood on Marbury Street. You'll notice falling out sections of roof, falling out windows, a tree growing out of the third story and gang graffiti all over it. This is a picture of Boston Planned Parenthood on Howard Street. Similarly, boarded up windows in all but one small building which is occupied. Trees on the rooftops, graffiti all over it. The reason I'm showing you these pictures is because death starts at Planned Parenthood and then spreads throughout the city. When abortionists kill a large portion of potential new life year after year, generation after generation, it has an obvious detrimental effect on local population. Buildings become vacant, businesses fail, and buildings as well as the city begins to crumble. Kill the babies and the city dies. Even if one ignores morality, common sense should tell everyone that a species that kills its offspring will not survive. Society needs strong families to flourish. So this legislature should be searching for ways to strengthen families rather than supporting the destruction of the preborn. 
SB 798 is to spread and support the abomination of premeditated contractual murder all over the state. If this bill becomes law, eventually Maryland will succumb to the same fate that has befallen Baltimore when there will be not enough taxpayers to sufficiently fund a properly run state administration. Please open your eyes to the damage already done and think of the future of this state and do not vote to move SBO 7984. Uh, I have a few other comments that you will find in my written testimony. Please look at it. Thank you. Brian Barmo with the Maryland Catholic Conference. Senate Bill 798 would establish a fundamental right to reproductive freedom and would enshrine abortion at any stage in our state constitution. We believe, we believe that every person is created in the image and likeness of God, and all life should be protected and respected from conception to natural death. There is no need for a constitutional amendment. Unfortunately, Maryland currently has one of the highest rates of abortions in the country, and Maryland is already a destination in the abortion travel industry. Maryland already ranks near the very top of states that carry out abortions by percentage of the population, and Maryland taxpayers already pay millions in taxes that go to providing abortions for others. This bill will only help, this amendment will only help increase these trends. As a society, we are broken when our response to any pregnancy is fear rather than joy. We must do better as a society to walk with mothers in need and help break down economic, social, racial, employment, and emotional barriers that lead mothers into thinking abortion is the only option. I think it's important to note also that the Declaration of Independence guarantees life. This is the opposite of that. It's going against the Declaration of Independence. And furthermore, I heard a lot of talk about strict scrutiny and compelling interests. And we all note that Dobbs is overturned, uh, 50 years of precedent. So then we're going to go ahead in, in the Maryland Constitution and enshrine a strict scrutiny test. But what happens 10 years from now when there's a Republican governor and they're, and they're pro-life? They could strike down this, this, this amendment because they can find a compelling interest in life and the fetus. So be careful what you're doing. What you may want it, may, you may want this amendment. It may come back to, to bite you. For these reasons, we're unfavorable on Senate Bill 798. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the Senate Finance Committee. I'm Deborah Bricado here on behalf of the Campaign to Protect Women, and we strongly oppose Senate Bill 798. Abortion needs to be unthinkable. Abortion is not a compassionate answer to women and girls facing a crisis pregnancy. It is never compassionate to tell a mother that killing her baby is the answer to her problems. True compassion offers practical and emotional support for women and girls in need, as is offered by the many crisis pregnancy centers in Maryland. Abortion does not remove poverty. Abortion does not make a bad boyfriend or husband good. Contrary to earlier statements, abortion has not been a right for 50 years. No law was passed to make it a right. We have a constitutional right to life. There are no penalties against women seeking abortion. There are no laws preventing doctors from treating women for miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, or other medical problems. Women deserve better than abortion. If enacted, this law will make Maryland an abortion destination. This law will make it easier for sex traffickers and other abusers to continue their criminal behavior. As a volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center for over eight years, I saw women who had experienced abortion. None of them felt it was a choice. It did not improve their lives and they would not kill their baby this time. They were grateful for the crisis pregnancy center, which supported them without discrimination because they were poor. Most of the young women were black and we know the abortion industry has long targeted the minority communities from the beginning, calling them undesirable. We know that this, this Margaret Sanger was a racist. We heard this from the other panelists. And I encourage you to oppose Senate Bill 798. We all know women who have suffered from the experience of an abortion. And for those of you who that may be true for you or have supported these laws supporting abortion, I ask you please to turn away from them and start promoting laws that protect and defend human life. Thank you. The Campaign to Protect Women opposes Senate Bill 798. Thank you all for your testimony. I don't see any questions from the committee, so have a good afternoon. I'm going to call forward the next group of names. Johanna Faith, James Walton, Brandy Dawson, 
Jason Van Bimmel, Catherine Quinn, Michael New. It looks like I have one more chair. So Catherine Adelaide. Sandy Christensen. Okay. Good afternoon. You can go ahead and begin. I'll start. Okay. Good afternoon, distinguished members. It's my pleasure to be here this afternoon. My name is Dr. Sandy Christensen, and I'm a OBGYN licensed in Maryland, and I also represent CareNet, who affiliates over 1,200 pregnancy centers in the U.S., and I work at a local pregnancy center. If this bill is enacted, abortion will be permitted up to term for any reason. We've heard this in, um, all afternoon. In fact, research shows there are considerable risks to women's mental and physical health, and I meet these women every week in my clinic. Women who abort because of an adverse diagnosis, if you look at the limited but available data, are actually more likely to experience grief, depression, and emotional stress compared to their counterparts who choose to carry their pregnancies. In the rare instances when the life of a mother is in jeopardy, purposely ending the baby's life is not therapeutic. Delivery is indicated along with efforts to save the baby's life, acknowledging the baby may be too premature to survive, this is not the same thing as an induced abortion, which has the sole intent of ending the baby's life. Big difference. Babies will be aborted simply because they have a disability or require special care. I don't think that's how a civilized society cares for its most vulnerable members. Further, the deregulation of abortion will harm women. When the FDA removed the in-person requirement for mifepristone, every woman in Maryland has access to a telehealth abortion. What's the problem with no in-person visits? There were three initially when the FDA approved that um, the drug. Ultrasound will not be ordered in most cases. So what will happen? We'll miss the ectopic pregnancies. This was addressed earlier. This could be life-threatening to women. This is serious. A phone call or a chat room is not the same as an in-person face-to-face visit. We all know this. We've all been to the doctor. When I went through medical school and residency, if someone had told me you can have a chat with a person and, and um, prescribe abortion, it would have been considered malpractice. It still is. So please, please um, consider these facts. And I asked for an unfavorable report. If this bill passes, Maryland will join the dubious uh, team of China and North Korea being one of the few places in the world that permits abortion up to term for any reason. Thank you for your attention. And I welcome questions. Hi, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak in opposition to SPS 98. My name is Dr. Jay Walton. I'm the president of Baltimore County Right to Life and the leader of 40 Days for Life in Lutherville, Maryland. Um, I'm here to oppose SB 798, what is also known as the right to reproductive freedom. Freedom, this word is, it is deceptive at best and evil at worst to associate freedom with anything related to the killing of innocent human beings. The American Heritage Dictionary defines freedom as the condition of being free of restraints, especially the ability to act without control or interference by another or by circumstance. It also defines freedom as the condition of not being controlled by another nation or political power. Now that you know the definitions of freedom, by passing this bill out of this committee, you are being deceptive to your constituents by telling them that they have the freedom to get an abortion. Moreover, as someone who counsels the scared young abortion-minded women, I can tell you, they do not feel free to make that decision to kill their baby. They do not feel as though they have a choice. Why? Why do they do it then? Because they are told by friends, family, their husbands or boyfriends, and politicians, 
that they need to get an abortion. If you pass this bill, you are telling millions of scared young women that they are not good enough to raise a child. You are telling them that they are not rich enough, they are not responsible enough, they are not educated enough. By passing this bill, you are telling millions of women that they are not enough. If you truly want to give young women reproductive freedom, you will not allow this bill to pass out of this committee. Thank you very much. My name is Dr. Katherine Quinn. Thank you for hearing me today. I'm a Maryland resident and an emergency medicine resident physician. Along with many other liberal leaning initiatives, I support universal health care, improved maternity leave, prison reform, and immigration justice. And as your constituent, I strongly urge this committee to vote down Amendment SB 798 on the basis of democratic principles. I don't expect that we will agree today on when human life begins, but I do appreciate that we share concern for the health and empowerment of women. Each month, women walk into our RER septic following a DNC. Others come for the full range of alternatives that the abortionist wouldn't discuss. One, in, one woman waited over eight hours in our waiting room to ask me to perform an ultrasound simply to show her the baby as the person at the abortion clinic, I word for word quote, would not show me the screen. Time and again, women state that based on race, age, and socioeconomic class, they felt coerced by providers into an abortion, leaving them with the opposite of a free choice. And on the worst day, I explained to a woman that her uterus was ruptured by the abortion and had to be removed. She will never be able to bear children again. This is not a first for our department. I have watched my pro-choice colleagues react with indignation each time another patient arrives following reckless treatment by the abortion industry. Do no harm. A foundational commitment of our profession is betrayed by our abortion providers. Women are being lied to when they are told that abortion is healthcare, when the abortions conducted aren't even held to the standards of healthcare. Codifying something that is not only killing children, but is an unregulated manipulative attack on women's bodies goes against democratic and Republican principles alike. This amendment will result in a significant increase in the numbers of women's health issues across Maryland. Please vote no. If nothing else, I beg of you, do not walk away today with the misunderstanding that women want this. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, distinguished members of this committee. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church, and I'm a part of Christians Advocating for Life. We are, as has been said before, a, a nonpartisan, multicultural group of Christian leaders throughout the state. And we are clear in our opposition to abortion, oftentimes for very personal reasons. Our pastors and church leaders and ministry leaders and lay counselors within our church network have spent hundreds, thousands of hours counseling with women who are dealing with crisis pregnancies in one way or another. I myself have spoken with young girls who feel pressured to get an abortion because their parents will disown them if they find out that they're pregnant. Uh, women who are being pressured by their boyfriends to just get rid of it. It's not my problem. I've also spoken to women who have had abortions and who deeply regret the choice that they almost always felt pressured into getting. And I also have very close friends who lost two babies due to late term fetal abnormalities. One was born, stillborn, and the second lived for less than six months. But they know that they were better off seeing their baby girls face to face and holding them in their hands rather than seeing them dismembered in the womb. Our country is founded on the basic principle that we are all created equal by our creator and that we have been given by him the inalienable rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The sad reality is that when those words were written and passed, they did not apply to most people in America. They did not apply to people of color. They did not apply to women. Thankfully, we've made great strides there. It is time for us to expand that protection to those unborn children who are the most vulnerable among us. Please oppose Senate Bill 798. Thank you.
Madam Chair, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. Good afternoon, my name is Brandi Dawson, and my colleagues and I represent Christians Advocating for Life. I was a practicing registered nurse for 26 years, and my BSN is from Johns Hopkins University School of Nursing. In my written testimony, you will find details of my experience working in labor and delivery. Prior to hire, I was upfront about being a Christian and my objections to participating in any abortions. Nevertheless, as early as during orientation, I was told to perform a saline abortion. And when I refused, I was forced to view the deceased baby. Additionally, elective abortions were slipped into my care without my full understanding. My written testimony also includes witnessing the distress of other healthcare workers, including a young nurse on the unit who cried as she shared that at a previous hospital, she assisted with a late term abortion and that she did not know that she was not allowed to say no. I resigned from labor and delivery in that particular hospital, and I did not return to labor and delivery for the remainder of my nursing career. The painful memories of these instances have stayed with me, and I continue to feel remorse for what I may have done. Any peace is in Christ alone. Healthcare practitioners that are not aware of their rights or do not have the means to fight legal battles for protection will continue to face discrimination and intense pressure for objecting to participate in abortion. How much more so under Senate Bill 798? And I refer you to the legal testimony of the Alliance Defending Freedom. Forcing healthcare providers to violate their consciences or religious convictions will only further negatively impact healthcare in the state of Maryland and worsen the nursing shortage. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, I appreciate this opportunity to offer testimony in opposition to SB 798. My name is Michael New. I'm a professor at the Catholic University of America. I'm also an associate scholar at the Charlotte Lozier Institute and a Paige Comstock Cunningham Senior Fellow at Americans United for Life. Uh, I'm also a resident of Hyattsville, Maryland, and I'm testifying in my capacity as a concerned citizen. Time is short. I'll get right to the point. SB 798 is a multi-million dollar abortion tax increase. By placing a fundamental right to an abortion in the Maryland state constitution, the Maryland Medicaid program will be required to cover elective abortions in all circumstances. In Alaska and Minnesota, where courts have recognized abortion rights in their state constitutions, their Medicaid programs have been required to pay for all elective abortions. Right now, the Maryland Medicaid program covers abortion in one of five specific circumstances. Life of the mother, current or future somatic health, her or future mental health, fetal abnormality, or the mother is a victim of rape and incest. Uh, these are broad circumstances, but they're at least limited circumstances. According to the most recent data from the Guttmacher Institute in 2015, Maryland taxpayers paid $5 billion for almost 7,000 abortions. That represents about 23% of the total. In states where the Medicaid program is required to cover all elective abortions, typically taxpayers end up paying for over 40% of abortions in some cases even more. So SB 798 will result in more abortions, more women facing a lifetime of regret, and again, will represent a multi-million abortion, ta multi abortion tax increase to already overburden Maryland taxpayers. Maryland was first recognized as a free state on November 1st, 1864. It should remain a free state, not a free abortion state. I recommend an unfavorable report on SB 798. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. I want to thank you for hearing all sides of this issue today. My name is Shohanna Faith and I am the Capital Area Regional Coordinator for Students for Life Action. We have, we are in all 50 states with more than 1,300 pro-life student groups across this country, and dozens of those groups are here in our state of Maryland. I actually had one of our groups from District 33 um, with me today earlier here. And we strongly oppose SB 798. And we've gathered outside of this state house every year for decades at the Maryland March for Life. I'm here today because I want you to see the next generation of young people. The majority of millennials and Gen Z 
about 58% oppose abortion through all nine months, which is what this bill would trap us into permanently. Uh, millennials and Gen Z are now almost a third of the voting bloc. Please do not secure a future that does not represent us, your people, and your voters. We believe abortion is the leading human rights atrocity of our time with over 63 million pre-born deaths since 1973. We believe human rights begin in the womb, and even the voiceless in the womb have rights worthy of our protection. Adding this amendment and furthering abortion violence will not legislate other issues that need to be taken up. The extremist abortion laws of our state rival those with horrific human rights abuses such as China and North Korea. Preborn children through all nine months here in Maryland are violently dismembered, poisoned, and discarded as trash through the abortion process. I also want you to remember women who deserve better than abortion, women like the plaintiffs in Carhartt's most recent lawsuits, the late-term abortionist whose clinic still operates in Bethesda, Maryland. Instead of passing legislation that has practically no limits on abortion or safeguards for the health of women, we need to protect all women and children from this violence, and we urge an unfavorable report. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the committee. So thank you all for your testimony and for being a part of our process. I'm going to call S. Warham and John Quinn. Good afternoon, and you can get started as soon as you're ready. Uh, Senator Griffith, Senator Klaus Meyer, and members of the committee, um, good afternoon. I'm Sheila Warren, Maryland Legislative Lobby for Life, speaking in opposition to putting the killing of the innocent and sexual mutilation into the state constitution. The bill speaks about ending one's pregnancy, but the point is not to end a pregnancy. They all end. It's to kill a child and put the killing of the innocent into our constitution. The wording of the bill shows that it also would permit minors to consent to their own surgical mutilation. Um, our constitution begins with this uh, a declaration of rights, that government of right originates from the people, is founded in compact only, and instituted solely for the good of the whole. Killing children is not for the good of the whole. It, it violates the original compact and is contrary to Article 16 of our Constitution's Declaration of Rights, the avoidance of sanguinary laws and unusual punishment. That sanguinary laws, the death penalty, ought to be avoided as far as is consistent with the safety of the state, and no law to inflict cruel and unusual pains and penalties ought to be made in any case or at any time hereafter. A newborn baby does not threaten the, uh, the safety of the state. An abortion which tears him limb from limb or scalds him to death with a salt solution or starves him to death inflicts cruel and unusual pains, thus violating Article 16. In addition, the words reproductive freedom of persons uh, can include minors consenting for their own freedom from ever reproducing and having their uh, healthy body parts surgically removed. Look at the wording in the amendment. The word person and the word individual includes males. Um, there is nothing here about uh, the age of age, so minors are also included. The bill says the right to reproductive freedom is not limited to ending pregnancy, so it can include sexual mutilation of reproductive areas. Beginning in kindergarten and through every um, other year, we're told, the children are told that a boy can be in a girl's body, a girl can be in a boy's body, So, and we should all accept it. So obviously, it's not a matter of state interest if a, a minor mutilates his or her um, uh, sex characteristics. The amendment, okay, so please uh, <laughs> vote against this bill. Thank you. Uh, John Quinn is on his way. And I'm wondering if I can switch spots with him. We're from the same organization and testify now, and he could take my spot later. Uh, this is, you can testify in John Quinn's spot, but that's the end of the in-person testimony that we have on this bill. Okay. Okay, so Thank he you. can't do it later. Thanks. Oh, okay. I did. Okay, that's fine. Yes, I did call your name. So if I mispronounced it, you can come up. Yes. Thank you. And that my, is my final answer on that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Kristen Day, and I'm the executive director of Democrats for Life. As a Democrat since I was 18, I've always believed that the government has a responsibility to help those in need. 
It's my democratic values that give me enormous concerns about this bill because it does not help those in need, it harms them, and it provides government protections for those who do harm. Maryland pays for abortion. It, abortion is legal in Maryland. Maryland is training more doctors to perform, more people, not necessarily doctors, to perform abortion. Maryland prioritizes abortion as a solution for poor pregnant women. According to the Guttenmacher Institute, 75% of women who seek abortion are financially insecure. Maryland's message is clear. Women who have resources have choice. Women without resources have abortion. As Democrats, this prioritization on pushing abortion as a solution is directly opposed to providing equity, fairness, and justice. Maryland has one of the highest abortion rates in the nation and one of the, high, and the highest maternal mortality rate in the nation. One third of pregnancies and an abortion in your state. Maryland finishes fourth from the bottom in the equity for pregnancy outcomes scorecard. So who benefits from abortion? Men, because they don't have to pay. Sex traffickers, because they can keep their product going without being uh, sidelined by a pregnancy. Corporations benefit because it's cheaper for abortion rather than provide accommodations and uh, paid leave. So abortion is big money uh, for big business. Maryland paid 6.5 million of taxpayer funds in abortion, which benefits politicians because that money goes back in their coffers. The money and who benefits is not consistent with democratic values. Passage of this bill would result in an expensive political campaign to pass a proposed constitutional amendment to abortion under the guise of reproductive freedom that, was, that would not result in any substantive change to the inequities. It would only benefit those who are already making millions off the backs of financially insecure women. I urge you to table this legislation or you can continue to race to the bottom of the pregnancy equity scorecard. Passing this legislation would put you on that road. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Vice Chair. I'm Jewin Killingsworth. I'm here with Christians Advocating for Life. Um, I know some of the, the issues that I have wanted to state have already, you can see on the information that was passed out. And um, basically what I feel in my heart we need to consider is that life is valuable, that life was created from the creator and not from ourselves that in fact, we need to consider uh, what the results of a, an abortion does mentally to so many people as has already been witnessed to and shared here. And then also the fact that in where we are now, we're seeing a total decline in the consideration in our nation and particularly even here in Maryland. What we're faced with is that people who have been hurt are hurting others. And abortion does hurt people mentally and physically. So I'm asking you to really consider to oppose, we're here to oppose this bill. I also would like to state that when God said that he says that I placed you in your mother's womb and we are not the creator, he is the creator. We have to consider that, that the value of everything that has taken place with an individual that has been aborted, has not been able to remain. And I'm not going to also emphasize the fact that we're really in a situation where we're considering population control. And that is one of the things that is taking place in Jesus. Name. Thank, you. Thank you all very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee. So have a great afternoon. We're going to move to our virtual witnesses on this bill starting with Rosalind Jonas, who signed up in favor of the bill. Good afternoon. Chair Griffith, members of the committee, thank you for listening. My name is Rosalind Jonas, and I've been a Maryland resident for nearly 40 years. In 1966, 17 years before I moved to Maryland, I had a difficult and challenging experience here. I was 20 years old, single, pregnant, and desperate. I stood alone on Utah Street in downtown Baltimore, waiting to be picked up by a man I'd never met, whose job it was to deliver me to the place where I was scheduled to have an illegal abortion. My abortion was performed in a farmhouse somewhere in rural Baltimore County by a man whose face I never saw and who may or may not have been a doctor. 
for his services. I paid him $600 in cash. I consider myself lucky. No health complications prevented me from later choosing to bear children. I had my abortion seven years before Roe v. Wade gave women the right to control their own reproductive destinies. Seven years before desperate women could stop using coat hangers and knitting needles and drinking poison. Seven years before girls and women could stop their search for the underground networks that existed to connect them with abortion providers. And seven years before desperate women had to come up with a cash equivalent of $5,200 today. We are faced with the reality today that Roe v. Wade has been overturned. 12 states, including our neighbor West Virginia, have total abortion bans. No one should have to endure the fear, uncertainty, and financial hardship that I did in 1966. That is the reality for too many right now. Maryland must take the first step toward asserting reproductive freedom as a fundamental constitutional right. I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 798. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee. So we'll move to our next witness, Dr. Layla Hauschman. Good afternoon. Madam Chair, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Layla Hushman, and I am a resident of Montgomery County, and I have a PhD in biomedical engineering. I'm here today in support of Senate Bill 798. In May 2021, before the overturning of Roe v. Wade, an abortion saved my life. And you might think that would have been a compassionate process, coordinated by my doctors and offered to me, but you'd be wrong. And I hope you'll listen to my story. Two years ago, my husband and I were expecting our first child, and I knew something was very wrong when I woke up at eight weeks and two days pregnant in severe pain and with vision loss in one eye. An ophthalmologist told me that pregnancy had caused a stroke in my optic nerve and I could become permanently blind, but that she couldn't do anything for me because I was pregnant. I was not willing to risk my vision for pregnancy. I wanted an abortion, but none of my doctors would help me. Not my ophthalmologist, she sent me home. And not my ob office either. The medical assistant who answered my urgent call begging for help with coordinating an emergency abortion refused to even let me speak with a doctor. And the religious hospital system that practice was affiliated with, their policies would not have allowed me to have an abortion fast enough. So I was on my own. I had to find a clinic on my own for the next day. And that was very lucky because the correct diagnosis was much worse than we knew. I could have died from a viral infection in my eye and brain triggered by the immunosuppression of pregnancy that we didn't know I had until after the abortion. And pregnancy would have prevented treatment for that infection. But the delay in care meant that I have lost most of the vision in that eye despite five surgeries on it by the best surgeons in the world. And I just found out two days ago that I need a sixth surgery and it will never be the same. I enthusiastically support Senate Bill 798 because there's no such thing as enough bodily autonomy. And if Maryland's laws weren't enough to protect me, they're not enough to protect anyone. I am here because of luck alone, but everyone deserves better than just luck. Thank you. I urge for a favorable report. Thank you for sharing your testimony and your experience. There's no questions from the committee. So we're going to move to our next witness, Crystal Kajeski, signed up in opposition to the bill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. And you got my name right. I appreciate Yay. it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so my name is Crystal Kajeski. And um, thank you for letting me speak, committee members. Um, I am a resident of Charles County. And I am opposed to proposed bill SB 798 and ask that you give it an unfavorable report. And as soon as I find the right piece of, <laughs> I'm a mess. I'm so sorry. There, that's better. Okay, very good. By making abortion a fundamental right, Maryland taxpayers will be forced to pay for all abortions when, in fact, a majority of Marylanders believe there should be at least some reasonable restrictions on abortion. This amendment also would compel physicians, hospitals, and other health care providers to participate in abortion in violation of their rights of conscience and free exercise of religion. Personally, it is already difficult to find an OBGYN in this state for reproductive health and women's care. This law would compel more doctors and nurses to leave the state, uh, leaving many Marylanders lost in seeking medical care when needed. Finally, by passing this bill, 
The Maryland legislature will be infringing on the freedom of speech guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States by barring all future attempts to pass life-saving legislation, such as partial birth abortion and dismemberment bans. We should be able to agree that children in the womb deserve better medical care than being partially born and then having their brains sucked out in their bodies or bodies being dismembered because of choice of the mother. Children as young as 24 weeks gestation can be born and survive. Maryland is one of only four states that forces taxpayers to pay for other people's abortions. It's one of only three states that shields abortionists from liability by refusing to report abortion data to the CDC. As a result, Maryland is failing to address women's reproductive health and the incidence of abortion-related maternal injury and death or risks to future miscarriage, preterm birth, or loss of fertility. If we truly care about women, we would not be having this discussion. Please vote against SB 798. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee. So have a good afternoon. We're going to move to Alexandra Rack. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Vice Chair and members of the Senate Finance Committee. My name is Alexandra Rock, and I am also a resident of Charles County, Maryland. Um, I am testifying today to urge an unfavorable report on adding a right to an abortion to our state constitution. You've heard multiple times today that our Maryland statutes already survived the Dobbs decision last June, despite all of the emotional rhetoric from the proponents of this bill. What you are asking for today is a divisive bill, which would only serve to foment discord between Marylanders at a time when we will we need more that unites us. And I must invoke the words of uh, the late Senate President um, Miller, who, um, even though he favored a woman's right to choose, felt that an abortion amendment would be far too divisive for this state. And I ask you to honor his memory um, in your considerations for this bill. I had a lot of time while waiting to testify to hear the testimony of the panels in favor of the spell. And I was really shocked to hear so many references to women needing this legislation while ignoring the 50% of American women who identify as pro-life. I am a pro-life woman. I am here testifying today as I did on February 21st with my newborn son, Elliot, who is taking a nap. Elliot is 11 days old. I was supposed to be testifying on February 21st for the House version of this bill with a nine-month pregnant belly, but Elliot came nine days early. Elliot only became a Marylander with his own bodily autonomy on February 18th at 2.41 p.m. When my contractions began at 2 o'clock a.m., he had no legal protections in this state from an abortionist forceps. You may think I'm being hyperbolic, but the Senate president was asked directly multiple times by his colleague, Senator Reedy, about late-term abortion or any specific restrictions on abortion providers that would make abortion safer for women, and he was unable to answer. I'm appalled and disgusted that no one wants to have a philosophical or biological discussion about what the unborn are and at what point they attain their personal agency, so I urge you to issue an favorable report for this unnecessary, divisive, and dangerous bill. And thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you for your testimony and sharing your story with the committee. We're going to go to Noah Artis. Good thank afternoon. You. Thank you. It's a Reedies, but uh, my Aridis. name is Noah. And uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Noah and I'm from Silver Spring and uh, I'm with the Hope Movement, and I urge and plead that you would vote no on SB 798. This bill first asserts that a, quote, central component to an individual's rights to liberty and equality has the fundamental right to reproductive freedom, end quote. Now, folks, of course, the right to reproduce and bear children is up to you. The problem is what follows. It continues, quote, including but not limited to the ability to make an effectuate decisions to prevent, continue, or end one's own pregnancy, end quote. My friends, if your pregnant reproduction has already happened, you're already, you already have a child in your womb. Scientifically, from the moment of fertilization, a new human zygote with its own DNA never to be replicated has been brought into existence by God, who says in Psalm 139, 13, for you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. If you claim to follow the science, you would acknowledge that irrefutably this bill gives mothers the right to end, aka murder, their own child. The reason murder is wrong is because God made man in his image. As the sixth commandment says, you shall not murder. It is sin, the breaking of God's absolute moral standard and law. It's the standard by which each one of you will be judged. But to solve the sin issue, because God is holy and no sin shall enter his heaven, uh, they who sin must be cast to hell. 
So God himself in the person of Jesus Christ entered the womb of the Virgin Mary, who was born, lived sinlessly, died a sinner's death on the cross, absorbing the wrath of God, rising again on behalf of his elect who repent, turn from their sin, and put their faith alone in him. Man's moral standards and law are subjective, just like black or Jewish people were once not considered human. It's not a matter of whether morality is imposed or not, but which man's or God's greater law, which all human laws ought to be derived. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. There are no questions from the committee. That will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 798. Colleagues, we're now going to turn to Senate Bill 786. Senator Hedelman, health, reproductive health services, protected information, and insurance requirements. Senator, good afternoon. If you have a panel, feel free to bring them forward. Yes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to get started. So I know that you have a long agenda this afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the Finance Committee. I'm uh, pleased to be here today to talk about Senate Bill 786 and why it is so essential to ensuring reproductive rights. On June 22nd, 2022, millions of Marylanders' lives were altered when they lost the fundamental right of bodily autonomy. With the Dobbs decision, the United States Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade and eliminated constitutional protections for abortion rights. One of the justices also suggested that other protections, such as a right to birth control, may also be called into question. Since the Dobbs decision, 14 states have implemented abortion bans, including our neighboring state of West Virginia. And by the end of this year, we could see about half of the states banning or severely restricting abortion. These restrictive states, however, don't seem content to just stop abortion within their own states. Instead, they're adopting aggressive tactics to intimidate and even criminalize residents who travel out of state to states like Maryland to seek abortion care. These tactics are creating a chilling effect on providers in states like Maryland where abortion remains protected, but our providers are frightened by the attempts from out of state to impose criminal, civil, and administrative penalties. And these fears are not theoretical. They are actually happening now. Only a few months ago, a 10-year-old girl had to travel to Ohio, sorry, from Ohio to Indiana for an abortion. She had been raped and had been pregnant for six weeks and several days, just past Ohio's limit on abortion care. The attorney general of Indiana publicly accused the physician who provided the abortion care to the 10-year-old of breaking the law. And the physician had to raise funding for security for her and her family and has since moved to another state and is suing the Indiana Attorney General for defamation of character. We don't know what has happened to this 10-year-old girl, but we can only imagine that having to travel out of state just added to the trauma of rape. Another example, a hospital, a hospital in Texas called law enforcement about a 26-year-old patient who had a self-induced abortion after Texas instituted its abortion ban. And the local district attorney charged the patient with murder. The charges were later dropped, but that patient, whose identity was publicly outed by these charges, has to live with that trauma forever of being jailed and having her most personal information revealed to the world. Senate Bill 786 is part of a shielding package. The other bill, 7859, Reproductive Health Protection Act, is being heard today in GPR. And that bill will protect Maryland from participating in out-of-state investigations of abortion and other legally protected reproductive health care. However, that bill cannot protect our providers and patients beyond Maryland's borders. 786 is a necessary companion to that shielding bill. If we don't enact this legislation, we will put our Maryland abortion providers and our patients at risk. We need to close these loopholes in our data privacy laws, or else Maryland abortion patients and their providers can too easily be identified. And this bill closes those loopholes by making a few very important changes. First, it will prohibit health records about abortion and other reproductive services from flowing over state lines through health information exchanges. 
We can keep aggressive states like Texas and Louisiana from accessing this information in Maryland through the shielding bill, but we cannot stop them from obtaining through a court order to an out-of-state provider. So if a Maryland abortion patient has seen an out-of-state provider for any reason, even just for an urgent care visit during a vacation out of state, there is a high likelihood that the provider will have the patient's abortion record through a health information exchange. Under the bill, patients would still retain the ability to consent to when and with whom their records could be shared. Second, it would prohibit prohibit dispensing information about mifepristone from being shared without the patient's consent. Pharmacy dispensing data is routinely integrated into electronic health records, and mifepristone, the main medication used in medical abortion, which are the majority of abortions, can now be dispensed by pharmacies because of a recent rule change from the Food and Drug Administration. This rule change is positive for access in underserved areas, but it also means that the identity of prescribers of mifepristone will be more broadly identified. If we don't provide protection to providers' identities, there will be a chilling effect on access to abortion care. Providers are afraid of threats of violence, and for good reason. Since the leak of Dobbs' decision last spring, three abortion clinics have been set on fire by arsonists or firebombed. Finally, the bill will create more guardrails to protect personal information of healthcare providers under Maryland's Public Information Act. And these guardrails will protect all practitioners, not just abortion providers. Nurses, in particular, suffer from high rates of workplace violence. And in recent years, the Maryland General Assembly has enacted several pieces of legislation to provide protections to these healthcare professionals from workplace violence. Today, you're going to hear from abortion providers and patients who will share their very real fears in this post-ops world. We'll hear from a Maryland provider who will tell us that many of her colleagues may be too afraid to provide abortion care for fear of being identified. We'll hear from providers on the West Coast who were the first to feel the impact of Senate Bill 8 enacted in Texas. And one of those providers will tell us that they have converted to using paper medical records because they're so afraid of the risk of electronic health records. It is possible that there'll be federal action on closing some of these loopholes in HIPAA. A group of senators, including Maryland Senator Chris Van Hollen, we have written to the Department of Health and Human Services asking for this rule change. But we all know how long it takes for federal rules and we know that the balance of power on the federal level has shifted all too easily in the past. With Senate Bill 786, we are on the right path. And an article in the Yale Law Journal written by one of our witnesses today and published in October states that, quote, the most effective legislative approach for states may be to prohibit electronic health record vendors and health information exchanges from facilitating the transfer of abortion-related data across state lines. And that's what we're aiming to do in this bill. In closing, I want to share some testimony that I received from the American College of Nurse Midwives. They said, we implore the Maryland General Assembly to protect Maryland abortion providers and their patients. Nurse midwives, along with our physician and nurse practitioner colleagues, are struggling to provide reproductive health care to Marylanders and out-of-state patients alike. We're afraid in the, of the long arm of the law of states like Texas, and we no longer believe the Supreme Court will protect us. Now, I'd like to turn over to the rest of my sponsor panel who will pro provide their perspectives. I know that this is a complicated issue, and many stakeholders will have contributions on how this bill should be shaped. You have an initial draft of sponsor amendments in your package, and I'm committed to working with the committee to ensure that we get this bill just right. We cannot afford not to get it right. It is just too important for access to reproductive health services in Maryland. I thank you for your time. Good afternoon, uh, Robin Elliott here today on behalf of Planned Parenthood of Maryland in full support of this legislation. Um, I think that Senator Hedelman did an incredible job at laying out really the very compelling case that we need to take action quickly. Um, I will note um, that you have testimony in your packet from CRISP, who I believe will speak later, from the Maryland Healthcare Commission and the um, Health Education Advocacy Unit of the Office of the AG all raising um, what I would call 
issues around technology and making sure that we are able to get the technology right in order to do this. Um, I think we definitely can work through and come up with a product that is implementable quickly because abortion providers are at risk in their patients. Um, in 2021, so this was before Dobbs, uh, the National Abortion Federation reported since the prior year, a 600% increase in stalking of abortion providers and 128% increase in assaults. We have seen since the Dobbs decision an increasing focus on the states where abortion remain legal. Uh, so our providers and the patients who are coming to see them are afraid for good reason, and we ask for a favorable report. Hello, my name is Ololade Sanusi. I'm a family medicine provider in Baltimore City. Um, as a doctor, my goal has been to provide the best care for my patients, and that has always included the electronic health record, as it provides an avenue to promote positive health outcomes through health information exchanges. Since the Dobbs decision, that goal has evolved over time to include the prioritization of the safety of myself, my fellow clinicians, and patients. This shielding bill is very important as it ensures that providers just like me are not intimidated and prevented from providing access to reproductive health care. And this very much includes the medication abortion with mifepristone and surgical abortions. I chose this profession wanting to help patients, but none at the expense of the safety of myself, staff, and family. We as providers deserve a safe environment to continue providing reproductive health care that's not available to our counterparts in surrounding states. And above all, allows us to provide an environment where patients' needs are served and not criminalized for access in full spectrum care, which includes abortion. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, again, my name is Chikia Johnson and I'm here on behalf of Maryland National Organization for Women. When was your last menstrual cycle? If you have a uterus, this is probably a question that you've heard many times, but what used to be a routine part of healthcare visits now has the potential to be incriminating evidence. On June 24th, 2022, after nearly 50 years of precedence, the Supreme Court struck down Roe v. Wade. Would that decision trigger laws in at least 22 states immediately banned or severely limited abortion in some and in some states like Texas, private citizens were given the authority to enforce these laws in exchange for cash, a move that Justice Sonia Sotomayor compared to Wild West style bounty hunters. Now, in Maryland, we're fortunate enough to be governed compassionately and autonomously. However, we still have a significant number of vulnerable people in our communities, college students. Students who attend college in Maryland but have primary residence in states with restrictive abortion laws are at risk of government access to and weaponization of their private health information. When a student visits their campus health center and reports a late period or needs access to services from an abortion care provider, those health records will be available to their home state physician. And in a state where the act of abortion is defined as a crime, those health records will be used to impose civil litigation. Senate Bill 786 will protect, protect those sensitive health records so that what happens in Maryland stays in Maryland. When students can take care of their reproductive health needs without the fear of being accused of criminal activity, they're better situated to achieve their educational and professional goals. And for that reason, I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 786. Thank you very much. We're gonna to go to Senator Guile, followed by Senator Hershey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you to the bill sponsor. It's a really important issue, and I really appreciate your work on this. But um, I, I do—I just have a question about the letter that was filed, the letter of concern that was filed by the Healthcare Commission. And I, I previously have spoken with Miss Elliott about it, but it was my understanding that they, or, or, or at least there was some concern about you know whether or not we have the technology to be able to implement this, and that was kind of the need to put it off. But it seems as if there are. Are, are more concerns raised uh, by the commission than just that? And um, I'm wondering if you could perhaps, e either one could, could comment, um, <clears throat> excuse me, about the most salient concerns that they've raised. Sure. Yeah. Um, so one of the uh, issues that they've raised is how to practically implement. So the definition in the bill as introduced is reproductive health. And from a 
technical perspective, what does that mean? So one of the things that they have raised as well as um, the uh, state designated health information exchange is that we need to be uh, narrower and more defined. Um, so in order if on a health record, um, in order to flag it for further protection, um, it has to be by either a diagnosis code or a procedure code or both. So we're working with um, all the stakeholders to figure out how we can narrow it to make it implementable as quickly as possible because we don't think we can wait. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the primary um, uh, uh, issues that they've raised. They've also raised an issue of how do you um, uh, define what is out of state in terms of technology. Um, we've known about this uh, issue that's been coming for years. Um, there are uh, similar protections for substance use treatment um, data. You probably all have heard bill hearings about that. It's called part two. So it's not unprecedented that this type of technology exists. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Hershey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. If I could follow up on my colleagues' comments, um, Robin, I guess for you, since you were responding, um, MHCC specifically says at the end that if the bill advances, the commission recommends delaying certain requirements of this uh, until January 1, 2025. Uh, are there enough amendments that are going to be able to satisfy their concerns to get this on board quicker than two and a half years. So I had a, a um, I had a very uh, wonderful conversation with the executive director of MHCC um, about uh, their letter. Um, I think these are issues that are being worked on nationally. So all of the people involved with health information technology are also involved in these national conversations. I do think that um, in general, people feel the urgency um, and that 2025 does seem uh, fairly far away when we're talking about the types of risks that um, that we are facing with what is going on with the DOPS decision. Thank you for the question. Our goal is to work with the Healthcare Commission, CRISP, um, to really come up with how to do something expeditiously, um, but that is implementable for them. Obviously, it has to be implementable in order to work. Okay. Um, another concern, just as, as background, in, in terms of medical facilities, um, what types of facilities actually perform abortions? So, so the types of licensed facilities that provide abortions are surgical abortion facilities. Um, they are regulated under the Office of Healthcare Quality. Some ambulatory uh, surgery centers perform abortions, not all. Um, and then some hospitals perform. So those are the three uh, types of licensed facilities that provide abortion care. And of those three, are any required to get a CON? So I believe hospitals are required to get a CON. The ambulatory surgery center question is a little bit trickier. I think it depends on the number of rooms in which um, you have uh, OR capacity, and it's gotten um, uh, even more complicated. Um, and so I'd be very happy. I know that the Healthcare Commission mentioned that in their letter. Um, be very happy to work with them to make sure that whatever is um, in the bill that you all consider um, when it goes to committee is precise and implementable. Okay. Um, you, you guys have mentioned that there are, are two um, bills that re, that involve information, the other one being heard in JPR uh, 859. Again, real quick, the difference between these two bills. Yes, happy to do that. So, um, and if anyone wants to catch it, we're headed there afterwards. <laughs> Although I think you had a long day yesterday. <laughs> so um, in essence, we call it the shielding bill. Um, about uh, six, to now I think it's up to seven states have passed these bills. And what they do is they say that the state um, cannot take action to further the investigations of 
other states into the type of care that would be legal here in Maryland. So that means things like not issuing subpoenas, not issuing court summons, um, and for health boards, which I know this is um, um, an area that you all are involved in, if somebody loses their license in Texas for this type of care that would have been legal here, um, that they're not um, uh, penalized because of that in Maryland. Um, and so that is what's being heard in JPR in maybe two hours. Right. When you talk about investigations, um, a witness earlier talked about um, since some states will uh, allow, I mean, what Dobbs did is essentially say the states can decide on their own. So some states have decided to take the route that Maryland's going. Some states have decided not to allow it. Um, her concern was sex trafficking. And, you know, I guess the word she used was pimps bringing up pregnant um, women that were part of, you know, what they were using and bringing them up to Maryland for abortions. Does, does that shielding bill prevent an investigation of, of that nature? I don't believe so. So the shielding bill is really about a, a state, um, let's say uh, Missouri has uh, proposed legislation that would criminalize crossing over state lines to obtain an abortion. So if somebody from uh, Missouri came to Maryland specifically for abortion um, and everything within that um, particular case uh, was legal, that's what the shielding bill protects. I think, and I'm not an, um, a criminal law attorney, but I think the uh, scenario that you suggest has all sorts of additional um, crimes that were committed. And so I do not believe that the bill that is being heard by JPR would at all prevent um, investigation into that case. Uh, okay. Into the human trafficking case. Okay. And then finally, last, last question. Um, Obviously, this is um, there's a lot of information that would be able to be gathered, I guess, without this bill. Um, does this bill prevent information being gathered, for instance, on the the number of procedures that are being done in, in the state or whether or not they're being done from out of state? I mean, I'm sure we do track in the state a number of different medical um uh, Procedures. I would imagine we know how many heart transplants we do in Maryland or how many people died of COVID a few years ago or, you know, continue. But does this prevent the gathering of that type of information for uh, for use in, in future policy decisions? This bill is very specific to protecting the identity of the patient and the provider. Um, and so... Um, there is still, of course, Medicaid still pays for abortions. There is an annual uh, report in the budget analysis on how many abortions are paid for. I, nothing in this bill would prohibit that. Prohibit any of that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to the panel. Um, a question, because as I was scrolling through this uh, testimony, there are uh, some amendments that are coming forward from CRISP, our health information exchange. Are you comfortable with those amendments that Chris is proposing? So I, you know, I've spoken with, um, of course, Senator Hedelman and our sponsor on the House bill is Delegate Rosenberg. Um, I believe we think they're a good start. Um, uh, there are a, a couple things we want to really address. Um, that is to make sure that as we consider um, uh, first of all, the bottom line is protecting information about abortion, as we consider um, if other states are doing things around restricting contraception, that we have a very robust um, uh, policy discussion about how to handle those. And so I think we might want to kind of bring some more people into that discussion. They've proposed a work group. Um, the one thing that's super important to us, um, and um, I think we will hear it from provider after provider, is the this change in FDA policy 
in which mifepristone can be dispensed by a pharmacy. This is great news. Um, it means that in rural areas, um, and if you have uh, providers in private practice who don't want to um, uh, stock uh, mifepristone, that they can call in a prescription, the same as any other medication. The, the problem is this, as Senator Hedelman described, this information is swept up as part of the claim submission and then reintegrate it into electronic health records. I think we've all had that experience. Someone, you go to a new provider and they have your complete history. Um, what that does in terms of uh, abortion care, however, because of the threat of violence um, to providers, um, that is really, really concerning to have the provider's names um, distributed that, that widely. And so that is a really important provision um, that is going to start happening soon, unless, um, as people may know, there's a court case looking at whether or not mifepristone is going to remain um, legal. But if it does, um, this is an urgent need because those pharmacies are going to start to dispense mifepristone, which is, again, a wonderful thing, but really raises some deep safety concerns. Got it. And then last question about uh, mifepristone. Um... Is there a case law that exists regarding shielding um, patient privacy when it comes to mifepristone? Yes. So um, there is uh, there are a couple cases I want to uh, point out. Um, first, there was a case in Maryland that went all the way up to our highest court, which I know has changed its name, but it then was called the Court of Appeals, in which it said the Department of Health um, has the right to redact information about specific people listed on licensure applications to protect them. Um, so that is an important case. I've cited that in my testimony, so you can kind of pull it up online if you'd like to see it. Um, there was another case. Um, this had to do with the original approval of FDA by Miffy Pristone. This is the court case that is being kind of fought out now in the Texas circuit. and. Um, uh, so after that occurred, which was in the early 2000s, there were public information requests for the actual employees, the names of the employees in the FDA involved in that process. Um, the U.S. Court of Appeals found, and the FDA re redacted those names, found that the FDA has fairly asserted abortion-related violence as a privacy interest for both the names and addresses of persons and businesses associated with Miffy Pristone. So it's absolutely in the in case law um, and there's precedent for doing this. So in, in that example, FDA was found to be um, okay to redact those names. Yes. Because of reviewers who did that. Yeah. And, and I would just follow up and to, to acknowledge that the threat was sufficient enough to allow that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Ellis. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Hillman, for this bill. So as a technology guy, I'm just thinking as far as uh, listening to the testimony as um, to uh, kind of protect information uh, in someone's medical record, when I'm electronic medical records, uh, you know, um, is there a technology, I'm just searching through the uh, testimony in, in the bill, um, but I'm not kind of clear as far as is there anything in the legislation which uh, suggests any kind of technology in order to do that, get that fencing, that geofencing around health information, for instance, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, assigning a uh, random identification number to a patient, only they know that number. So if they go out of state, you know, just don't give that number to a prescriber or anything like that uh, in this legislation? Um, that's a, a great question. And I think because technology changes, um, we avoid it putting specifics about that technology into the legislation. Mm -hmm. That would be something um, really to uh, work out with the Healthcare Commission um, CRISP has great expertise. Um, what we we do have understood, and we've talked uh, to advocates working on this across the country, is that the the key is that 
it needs to be the vendor, the electronic health record, the health information exchange, rather than on the provider or the original, uh, the actual patient um, to um, sort of enact these in order for it to really work and to be efficient. Um, I, you know, I also wanted to add um, just, uh, you know, it's really, really important for the patient to be able to do what they want. It's their data. So there are very clear provisions in the bill that if the patient wants the data to go to a provider, then it goes. Nothing in this bill would prevent a patient from deciding who they want to share their information with. And in fact, it's very patient-centered. It's right. rest the decision on the patient. Yeah, thanks. For that. I'm just concerned about those patients who might not have the uh, um, knowledge of the repercussions of what's happening throughout the country. And they don't really have the experience, knowledge, uh, advice from professionals. And they do a random trip somewhere and you know, uh, getting that. So the, you're saying that uh, the way the bill is written will authorize um, whichever agency to come up with the required standard where the patients will be protected. And that's pretty much uh, clear direction in the bill. Right. And that and that the example that you gave is the very reason why the default is to prohibit it unless it is wanted by the patient okay. to share. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions for the sponsor of this panel. So we thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. We're going to call forward Christine O'Donovan Zavada, Ann Seacott, Nicole Sweeney. Favorable, favorable, and favorable with amendments. Good afternoon. Oh, oh sure. Uh, sorry. <laughs> or do you want me to? I, I'll I'll be right. I think I have it. I'm good. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Seacott, uh, and I'm here today testifying on behalf of the Maryland chapter of the National Association of Social Workers in support of Senate Bill 786. Um, social workers are not providers of abortion care, but social workers provide all kinds of other supportive care um, to people who may be, um, uh, you know, either either victims of. Uh, sexual assault or perhaps domestic violence, um, and obviously provide support to a whole range of people's needs um, as uh, the, the number one profession of mental health counseling in uh, the country. So um, social workers are also concerned about any type of care they may be giving and to a person and how that gets attached to their record and just not knowing what's coming when it comes to the things that the other states that other states are doing in terms of, um, you know, getting going on the offensive when it comes to uh, providers, even in other states, um, social workers are also concerned and also want the protections that are provided in that in this bill. So that's why we are favorable. Chair Griffith, uh, members of the committee, for the record, um, I am Christine O'Donovan Zavada, and I'm from Allentown, Pennsylvania. Um, in the summer of 2018, because of a broken condom and a failure of emergency contraception, I got pregnant. It took several weeks of violent nausea for me to realize that the emergency contraception I had taken had likely failed. When my pregnancy test came back positive, I felt a horrible, horrible pit in my stomach. I felt a total lack of control, like my body had been hijacked without my consent. And my decision was not difficult. I knew immediately that I needed an abortion. Pennsylvania has a politically motivated and paternalistic 24-hour waiting period that requires people who have to travel far distances to get to a clinic to go for two days in a row. And 87% of Pennsylvania counties do not have abortion clinics. So rather than drive twice, to the nearest clinic 90 miles away, I decided to drive a little further, but just once to Baltimore. When I arrived, the clinic staff were wonderful. 
They talked me through what I could expect and made sure that I felt safe and comfortable with my decision. It was a refuge. I also had an incredible network of friends that helped me both monetarily and emotionally, a job that supported me, provided time off, and I had a car that I could rely on for travel. But now with the overturn of Roe, that pit in my stomach has returned. I know to the core of my being that if I had been in a place where I couldn't legally access abortion, I would have found a way to end my pregnancy at whatever risk to my life. I might not have survived, but I know that I would not have carried to term. 12 states have now banned abortion outright, and several have added criminal and civil penalties for patients like me, for the clinic staff and the friends who supported me. And since the fall of Roe, I have been thinking constantly about the people that, were, that are facing the same decision that I did, with the same conviction that I had, often with fewer resources and now with more barriers than I had, making that very same trip to Maryland for refuge, just like I did. They deserve every protection this state can afford them. I urge a favorable report on SB 786. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hello, Madam Chairwoman and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on this important piece of legislation, which we are supporting with amendment. My name is Nicole Sweeney, and I'm the General Counsel and Chief Privacy Officer of CRISP, Maryland's health designated health information exchange and health data utility. I am here today because, as Senator Hedelman just said, we cannot afford not to get this right. CRISP was created a decade, decade ago in partnership with the state and continues to be an asset for the state. CRISP is committed to patient privacy and considers patient choice paramount. We allow patients to entirely opt out of the HIE, provide patients with an auditing of disclosures, and we work with a consumer advisory council on issues of privacy. Our data governance committee must approve uh, data before we can share it for new purposes. I'm so grateful for the intent of this bill. I am proud to live in a state that has made a first of its kind law to protect sensitive health information. For the past decade, I have worked on legal issues intersecting data exchange and data privacy. On a comparable issue, I previously worked to help, help SAMHSA promulgate updated substance use disorder regulations, the one um, Robin talked about with part two. Um, and so to, to make sure that uh, the records were uh, kept safe, um, but were allowed to flow. But I know that, based on my experience as written, this bill will have unintended and potentially life-threatening consequences for people with uteruses. The industry is not yet capable of what's called segmenting data. But simply, we cannot take a health record and delete or stop the exchange of individual lines of data. I know this because of my experience with SAMHSA. And so a patient may come and have a reproductive conversation about their last menstrual period, and that could be considered segmented data, and the entire record would be blocked, um, which is something that we do not want to happen. We do have the technology to segment these rec records if we know the codes of the sensitive procedures. We can filter out these data. Therefore, we ask that the committee amend the bill to specify certain code sets that should be filtered and protected when going out of state. With this solution, cons uh, consent could be limited to the code set without having patients' entire records blocked. Thank you very much. Senator Lamb. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. This question is to follow up on Ms. Sweeney's, uh, I guess, point there. The, uh, you know, as patients are coming into the clinic or into the hospital, the provider will oftentimes designate a code, usually for billing purposes. That's why these codes are there. Um, what's the the provision for, there, there are changes in codes and there may be new diagnosis codes that are created and such. What's the provision there to update these codes if new codes need to be designated to be segmented off in this way? Yeah, that's exactly right. And thank you for that question. Um, so that's something that, that we very much thought about when we submitted amendments to this bill. Um, diagnosis codes change, things change, medical procedures change. And so we are suggesting that there is a committee that is responsible for updating these codes. And that is not you know, written, maybe some of them are written directly into the law that we know won't change, but otherwise there is a committee that is responsible for updating them and providing them on an ongoing basis. Okay, so that's the committee that I saw in your proposed amendment. That's correct. From, yes. from Chris then. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, because those codes do change. It would urge kind of a global look at that in the long term. Um, the the piece about segmenting, and there are parts of the medical record where people are providers are just entering free text and not necessarily it's not necessarily attached to a code. Right. How is that addressed? 
So without um, overthrowing my coverage and talking more about technology than a lawyer ever should, um, I will say that that is something that we deal with on a fairly regular basis. Um, and there are ways to you know, stop the free text um, and get diagnoses codes and get other things through. Um, and there are also ways to parse the data, again, if we have specific words or specific codes related to it. Um, so it is definitely doable from a technology perspective. Um, it all comes down to having that agreed upon set of codes or set of keywords or various things like that that we can filter against. Okay. All right. That's helpful. I, I would agree with you that I think the the technology is there to be able to filter this and segment the information off. I think what oftentimes is lacking is the will, and hopefully this bill will give us the will to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Ellis. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, panelists. Um, again, uh, Ms. Sweeney, since you were with the uh, technology agency, <laughs> even though you're a lawyer and not deeper in technology, but you're closer to that than I am. So, um, so um, some of the, I'm just really concerned about the technology, the patient, no matter what code we change, you know, everyone else will know what the code is, right? And so you have that patient that comes and receive any kind of reproductive care, um, no matter how it's coded, uh, <laughs> Uh, that patient has to, that provider has to bill for the service and it goes into all these databases, right? Multiple databases uh, and shared. Uh, so is there any way uh, you think to um, fence off uh, that data for that patient so that the uh, out-of-state uh, provider can have access to it um, for the patient? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Senator Ellis. And this is um, uh, the te technologist telling me I know more about technology than I let on. So um, <laughs> I'll try to explain this. So we um, th the idea here, oh, I'm sorry, the idea here is that we would filter based on a code set, right? So it's not that we would give the code a new code. Mm -hmm. It's that if that data were going out of state, mm -hmm. when, and we typically know when it's going out of state, we know when it's going out of state, we would filter based on, we would send an entire record, but the codes that had whatever the specific codes are would not be given with the rest of that record. So it's not a matter of, you know, we called the code one, two, three in Maryland. And then when we sent it out, we called it X, Y, Z, and someone can translate. It just would not get through at all. Okay. So that code, that procedure that's billed to out-of-state uh, uh, insurance company, whatever, Will that company out of state be able to say, hey, this is a patient uh, name and procedure and make that connection in a different state? I'm just kind of curious about that part of it. Yeah, I definitely think that's something from the payment perspective that we would have to work through more. Okay. But I do think, um, as Senator Lamb just said, the technology is there. Um, the will hasn't always been there to do it, um, but it is doable. Um, it's just a matter of the will and the urgency. Okay, good. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions from the committee. Thank you very much for sharing your personal experience with us. And thank you both for your testimony. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. I'm going to call forward Laura Bogley and Kristen Day signed up in opposition to the bill. Good afternoon again. Good afternoon again, Madam Chair, member of the committees. I don't see Kristen Day, but of course there's been a, a lot of bill stacking and we're trying to get to multiple bills at the same date and time. So I'm, so, I'm sorry, to, you'll miss her. Uh, again, I'm Laura Bogley, Executive Director of Maryland Right to Life. And I urge your unfavorable report and ask for you to put pregnant patients above abortion politics and profit. This bill claims to protect women's privacy, but in truth, it is an abortion shield law designed to protect abortion providers and abortion drug dealers at the expense of women's health. By enacting this legislation, the Maryland General Assembly will be turning a blind eye to the suffering of women as the result of botched abortions and drug-induced abortion injuries. One nationally known late-term abortionist operating in Maryland until just very recently 
is responsible for countless hospitalizations and the deaths of at least two women in Maryland, beginning with Kristen Gilbert, a 19-year-old woman who died from complications from a 29-week late-term abortion in 2005. But instead of taking away this abortionist license, the state let him continue to practice, leading to the 2019 death of Jennifer Morbelli, a 29-year-old woman who traveled from New York and died of complications from a 33-week late-term abortion. Two more women were near fatally injured at the same abortion practice in 2020, when the abortionist perforated the uterus of both women, shoving baby body parts into the abdominal cavity of one woman who required a full hysterectomy to save her life. The state never held this abortionist accountable for these injuries and deaths, and this bill will only ensure that Maryland will be a safe harbor with for negligent abortionists and unsafe for women. This bill also hurts women by shielding the manufacturers and distributors of lethal abortion drugs, which are four times more dangerous than surgical abortion. Through teleabortion and the unregulated proliferation of these abortion drugs, including those made in China that are not approved by the FDA, the abortion industry itself has exposed women to back alley style abortions where they bleed alone without medical supervision or assistance. And I want to note that last year I worked with the state police. There were zero reported acts of violence against uh, the abortion clinics and two acts of, viol of uh, vandalism against pro-life pregnancy centers. So I urge your unfavorable report. Thank you. I'm seeing none. Thank you very much. And now we will go to the uh, virtual. We have quite a few of them. So the first is... Judy Barbone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Judy Carbone. I'm a resident of Garrett County and an active member of the Mountain Maryland Alliance for Reproductive Freedom, a nonpartisan grassroots organization committed to assuring and expanding reproductive health care and freedoms to residents in rural Mountain Maryland. Today, I will be reading a statement of support for SB 786 on behalf of a provider who did not feel safe in being publicly identified. This will highlight the need to pass this bill to protect our providers. The provider statement is as follows. In September of last year, the West Virginia legislature passed a total abortion ban with hollow ex exceptions for survivors of rape and incest. Since then, hundreds of West Virginians have had to flee their home to access abortion care. Many of them have come to Maryland. We know what happens when a person is died, denied an abortion. They face economic hardship, which lasts for years. They often have lower credit scores, greater amount of debt, and are more likely to face eviction and bankruptcy. They are more likely to stay in contact with a violent partner or raise their children as single parents. These factors combine to worsen childhood development and wellness. West Virginia has one of the highest rates of children living in foster care and ranks 45th in the nation for teen births. And West Virginia legislatures have set their sights on a new target, trans kids. Legislators are working to dismantle access to gender affirming hormone therapy for West Virginia minors, care that is evidence based, reversible, and literally life saving. This bill does not protect uh, this care and should be rectified. West Virginia is depending on Maryland as a safe haven. When you cross into Maryland on Highway 68 in Garrett County, the welcome sign states, leave no one behind. Make good on that promise by protecting clinicians who provide abortion and gender affirming care. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll have Carlene Zubrazinski. Zubrazinski. Good afternoon, Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee. Thank you. Uh, my name is Carleen Zubricki. We skip the Z. Uh, and I am a professor at the University of Connecticut School of Law. I study medical records issues and privacy issues. And I've written on the importance of better protections for medical records related to abortions. My most recent piece on this was published in the Yale Law Journal and was quoted at the beginning of uh, this session. So I want to testify in support of this effort to increase the confidentiality of patient and provider information related to abortion. Um, Senator Hittleman teed up the problem just right. 
right? The, the bottom line is that medical information, including the details of abortion procedures or medication or the use of, use of assisted reproductive uh, technologies, travels very widely throughout our medical system, far more than most people realize. This is because medical records are increasingly interoperable, as I can also see that some folks in the room understand quite well. Uh, but the result is that if you receive an abortion in Maryland and travel somewhere else to West Virginia, say, and you go to sub subsequently go to just about any doctor's office in West Virginia, there's a pretty decent chance that the information from your abortion procedure, procedure could make its way to uh, not just providers, but anybody who has access to the medical record, right? Which could include lab technicians, nurses, you know, beyond just sort of even one treating provider. Since there are significant forces that are poised to go after out of state or cross state abortions in particular, via creative litigation and prosecutions, that easy flow of medical information creates a real problem and it creates real anxiety for patients and providers. Uh, taking action to expressly protect that kind of information uh, will, along the lines in this proposed bill will, will uh, make it much less for in-state providers to find themselves in the crosshairs of that sort of information and will also protect patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Carleen. Any seeing no questions, we'll go to our next uh, panelist, and it's Rosalind Jonas. Thank you. <clears throat> you're you're on mute. Mute. How's that? Okay. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for hearing from me again. My name's Rosalind Jonas. I've been a Maryland resident for nearly forty years. As I previously testified. In 1966, 17 years before I moved to Maryland, I had a difficult and challenging experience here. I was 20 years old, single, pregnant, and desperate, and I had an illegal abortion performed in a farmhouse somewhere in rural Baltimore County by a man whose face I never saw and who I presumed to be a doctor. But I consider myself lucky. The people who helped me were trustworthy. No record of my care was accessible to anyone who might act in bad faith and no health complications prevented me from later choosing to bear children. Sadly, my story is increasingly relevant today. I had my abortion seven years before Roe v. Wade became law, seven years before desperate women could stop using coat hangers, knitting needles, and stop drinking poison, and seven years before girls and women could stop their search for underground networks that existed to connect them with abortion providers. Today in Maryland, abortion patients seeking care can find a network of compassionate, qualified abortion care providers, something I was unable to do. But just as I was, they are faced with the realities of coming up with large sums of money and fearing reprisal for an act now considered illegal in 12 states. To ensure the security of abortion care providers and patients and avoid a return to the reality I had to live in Maryland in 1966, I urge a favorable report on Senate Bill 786. Thank you. Thank you. Um, seeing no questions, thank you very much for your testimony. And next we have Dr. Pano Los Lousy. Hi, I am Dr. Pana Lossi, and I am a UC San Francisco clinical professor and faculty at the Santa Rosa Family Medicine Residency Program in California. For almost 30 years, I have provided care and trained residents in cradle to grave full spectrum family medicine, including abortion. I volunteer on a hotline and just last night I spoke with a desperate woman who lives in a state that has banned abortion and was raped and so she is planning to drive eight and a half hours to Maryland. She is unaware that the electronic record of her abortion in Maryland could be transmitted by a health information exchange to providers in her state. If she did know, she would be terrified. I'm scared for these vulnerable patients and for providers as well by this huge hole in our privacy protections. 
I also work in a small abortion clinic in an abortion sanctuary state with many hostile states around it. We actually chose to only use paper charts in large part due to the problem of electronic health records connecting with health information exchanges and passing sensitive information across state lines. Using paper charts is incredibly sad because we have long hoped that electronic health records would decrease duplication of effort and facilitate communication between doctors and hospitals. However, I was recently on a call with perinatologists at a tertiary care hospital who are also stymied by this problem. They get referrals for incredibly complex pregnant patients from around the country, and they need to coordinate care with the referring providers, so they don't want to go to paper charts. However, they too are aware that they can't keep electronic records private across state lines, and this puts doctors and patients at risk. Maryland legislature has an opportunity to lead the way by fixing this critical problem and ensuring sensitive medical information does not cross state lines. I urge you to pass SB 786. Thank you okay, very thanks. much. Thank you, doctor. Any questions? Seeing none, thank you very much for, for your testimony and have a nice afternoon. And next we have Dr. Michelle Gomez. Madam Chair and members of the committee, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Dr. Michelle Gomez and I'm a family medicine physician and faculty with the UCSF School of Medicine in California. I'm also proud to say that I grew up in the great state of Maryland and I'm grateful for the excellent education I received in Montgomery County Public Schools. I've been providing and teaching both primary care and abortion care for 20 years and I'm here today because I'm very concerned for my patients and my colleagues. Let me give you two examples from my own experience. I have patients who live in Texas who come to me for abortion care. Early in the pandemic, one of my Texas patients continued to bleed after she returned to Texas, so she went to the emergency room. That day, I got a notification through my electronic medical record, EPIC, that the patient was seen in a Texas ED. I could see the whole visit. That was the first time it occurred to me that everyone who saw her in Texas could also see her entire visit with me. They knew she had had an abortion. She was referred to an OBGYN in Texas who could also see that she'd had an abortion. How many other people, nurses, social workers, billing people, et cetera, had access to that information? What if someone had said, I know her and I saw her here in Texas that weekend and I know she didn't leave the state. I bet she lied to that doctor and had someone in California mail those pills to her here in Texas. Under Texas law, I could be punished with life in prison and or a $100,000 fine just for helping a patient do what she felt was best for her own body and her family's future. Also under Texas law, anyone close to my patient who may have known what she was doing could be sued for $10,000 and serve up to five years in prison for aiding and abetting her. So far, this hasn't happened, but it's only a matter of time until it happens to someone. I am now forced to use paper medical records for all of my out-of-state patients, which may put me in violation of other laws. One more example with more serious consequences. A colleague of mine in Tennessee saw a patient for an abortion. The patient went back to their home state of Kentucky and had a similar experience, bleeding the center to the ED and then to an OBGYN. A CPS case was opened on this patient and she's now dealing with all the ramifications of being accused of being an unfit mother to her children. As a mother myself, I cannot even imagine that heartbreak and fear. Please, I urge a favorable report. This is urgent. These are real human lives. Marilyn has the opportunity to be a model. Thank you. Seeing no questions, thank you very, very much for your testimony and have a nice afternoon. Next, we have Matt Madison Anderson. No? Yes, sorry. I oh, got confused because I unmuted myself and then it asked me to unmute. Um, Good afternoon, Chair Smith, members of the committee. Thank you. For the record, my name is Madison Anderson. I'm 22 and I'm from Houston. On September of 21, I had come out of a two-year relationship. I decided on the 15th of September to take a pregnancy test. The line had developed before the control line and I was in complete and utter disbelief that it had happened. So I ended up calling a sorority sister to bring me more pregnancy tests. I had five positive pregnancy tests in front of me. And after that, I knew that I was more than likely wanting to get an abortion. I called Planned Parenthood to schedule my first appointment. And while on the phone, the representative explained to me that SB8 was an abortion ban after six weeks. The earliest they could get me in was a week. And 
after talking to the clinician, I estimated myself to be about four and a half weeks. To my surprise, I measured at 10 and a half weeks. That meant that I couldn't get my abortion in Texas. The earliest I could be seen was two weeks later at Jackson Women's Health Organization in Mississippi, but the appointment required two separate visits by car and plane. By the time I finally accessed the care I knew I wanted, three weeks and three doctor's appointments had passed. I didn't know how they kept my records, but more and more providers are using electronic health records. If any one of those appointments kept an electronic health record, then there is a record that I was pregnant and it is apparent that I did not keep that pregnancy and carry it to term. Texas has already put my support network at risk with SB8, my sorority sister, my family, and the, the providers for Jackson Women's Health Record Health Organization were all at risk of being sued for helping me. I don't know what the plans are for the people that are in session now. I want to make sure that there are as many people that are able to make safe places available for healthcare. Electronic health records are supposed to make healthcare easier, but not knowing how my state is going to have the future, we need to make it available. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, seeing no questions, thank you very much and have a nice afternoon. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And next we have Shirley Rivers. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee. Thank you for hearing my testimony on behalf of Baltimore City Administration. I am testifying in support of Senate Bill 786. Reproductive care is an essential part of health and well-being, and, reprodu and reproductive care services remain protected by law. Health information provides insight to personal and often very sensitive information, including doctor's visits and treatment information. Protecting this information enables protection from potential discrimination, bias, violence, reputation, and denial of services. Relinquishing this information could put individuals at risk for discrimination and could cause real harm. In, current, in the current climate of states restricting access to abortion care and other reproductive services, <coughs> in Maryland, as in other states, HIPAA law requires health care healthcare providers and health insurers protect patients' privacy. Of particular import, importance, the rule includes protections that restrict disclosure of protected health information and provide for confidential communications. Additionally, medical providers have taken an oath to do no harm. Maryland has an opportunity to set, uh, Maryland has an opportunity to remain a safe place for people to remain um, safe to receive care. In the coming years, it is possible that individuals that might come to Maryland to receive care that is lawful here in Maryland could return to a state where that care is unlawful. It is important that Maryland ensures that these patients' data remain private so that they cannot be prosecuted for the care that they received that was lawfully obtained. In 18 states, home to 25 million women, reproductive age, they have banned some or all access to abortion care with only spare exceptions to nearly impossible to implement. On behalf of the Baltimore administration, we hope that you give a favorable response to Senate Bill 786. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no questions from the committee, I want to thank you very much for hanging in. And uh, that ends uh, Senate Bill 786. We saved the best to last, right? Thank you so much. I appreciate okay. you, Chair. Right. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Colleagues, we're now going to turn to Senate Bill 554. This is the Maryland National Guard TRICARE Premium Reimbursement Program Establishment Health Care for Heroes Act of 2023. I understand we're going to have as the sponsor Adjunct General Timothy Gowan. And on the panel, Julian Plowman and Brad Fallon. You all can come on up. And you can get started as soon as you're ready. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Hosmeyer, distinguished members of the Finance Committee. For the record, I'm Major General Tim Gowan, the Adjutant General of Maryland. I'm here today on behalf of Governor Moore to present Senate Bill 55, 554, sorry, the Healthcare for Heroes Act. 
I have with me Julian Plumman, the manager of legislative affairs for National Guard Association of the United States, and Brad Fallon, deputy excuse me, legislative officer for Governor Moore. The Health Care for Heroes Act seeks to establish Maryland as a leader in creating an environment of service by helping both the health and finances of our brave men and women who serve in the National Guard. This legislation establishes a program to reimburse members of the Maryland National Guard for health care and dental premiums paid for themselves and their families. The reimbursements created in this legislation create an avenue to free health care for service members and their families. In addition to expanding access to coverage for those who serve our communities and nation, this program will serve as a powerful recruitment and retention tool for the Guard. This legislation presents an opportunity for Maryland to lead the nation to ensure that our Guard is combat ready and that our service members are well aware of the way their state appreciates their service. In fact, Maryland would be the first of 54 states and territories to create a program of this nature. And this is attracting attention from all over the nation. The Chief of the National Guard Bureau, General Dan Hokinson, has, st has stated that creating universal health care for Guard members is his top priority. Enactment of this legislation will affirm Maryland's commitment to support our Guard members and their families and thank them for their services and sacrifices made in, the, in, their, in our interest. For centuries, members of, the, members of the Guard have answered the call whenever and wherever they are needed, from responding to attacks on the homeland to helping our front lines the COVID-19 pandemic, to supporting peacekeeping missions around the globe. Members of your Maryland National Guard have been there for all of us, and this is an opportunity for us to send a powerful thank you. The Maryland Military Department is excited to partner with you as members of this legislature to lead the nation in this important program. I respectfully ask you send a powerful message about Maryland's support for National Guard and voting fa favorably on Senate Bill 554. Thank you. Brad. Well, thank you, General. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair and members of the Senate Finance Committee. For the record, my name is Brad Fallon, and I'm a Deputy Legislative Officer for Governor Moore here on behalf of the Governor's Office. Uh, General Gowen just gave a great overview of what the bill seeks to accomplish and the impact that it could have as Maryland establishes itself as a state that puts a high value on service and appreciating those who serve. So I'll just speak to the technical aspects of the bill. The bill creates the TRICARE Premium Reimbursement Program within the military, Maryland Military Department. Since TRICARE is a federal program, we do not have the ability to subsidize the cost of premiums before they are incurred by service members. However, we can reimburse on a monthly basis once proof of these costs that are provided to the program. $5 million provided in the governor's budget proposal to fund this program in fiscal year 2024. The exact cost of the program and this $5 million is provided based upon an anticipated usage as the program gets up and running. The reimbursement itself can be provided directly to members of the Guard for premiums paid both for their own and their family's health and dental care under the specifically named TRICARE programs. I'm very happy to, to say that as for as impactful as the bill is, it is not overly complex. It's fairly straightforward language uh, written as a grant program. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. But otherwise, I would just ask the committee for a favorable report. Thanks so much. Chairman Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, and other distinguished members of the committee. For the record, my name is Julian Plowman, and I serve as the Legislative Affairs Manager for the National Guard Association of the United States. Coincidentally, I too am a member of the Maryland National Guard. I am before you today strongly in support of Senate Bill 554, the Health Care for Heroes Act. On behalf of the almost 45,000 members of the National Guard Association and nearly 450,000 members of the National Guard, we truly appreciate this opportunity to share our thoughts today, and we also thank the Governor and General Gowan for inviting us to participate. Under the leadership of Governor Moore, Maryland has the opportunity to lead the nation and provide essential benefits for the National Guard soldiers and airmen serving in your state. While federal legislation is pending and debate continues in Washington, 60,000 National Guard members across the force do not have health care coverage. Through SB 554, Maryland could be the first state to correct this wrong. It's the, it's the right thing to do, but it would also dramatically increase readiness, improve retention, and ultimately provide an incentive to employers. The operational tempo for the National Guard has increased significantly over the past 20 years, and more so recently. Since March of 2020, 
Over 320,000 National Guard members have been activated for either overseas deployments or state missions. From the pandemic, civil unrest, wildfires, and floods, the National Guard has responded. To remain always ready, we must ensure that each member is provided health care in order to meet the medical deployability requirements. Establishing this program would improve retention and help, remain, re, help retain a manned and ready force. Continual preventative care throughout our service members' careers will also reduce medical expenditures when they transition from drilling guardsmen to veteran. Furthermore, reliable medical coverage allows those within our ranks to seek consistent mental health care when and if needed. It would be unthinkable to not provide active service members health care, and the National Guard should be treated the same. I cannot think of any better way to truly put our service members first. Thank you for considering this bill, and we thank Governor Mill for leading the nation. Thank you very much. We'll go to Senator Guile, followed by Senator Lamb. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I just have one quick question. I mean, I, I love the bill, of course. I was co-sponsored on it, and 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 thank you, General Gowan and uh, panel, for your testimony. Um, the premium reimbursements are those taxable? Do you know? They that that's a great question. They would be. Yeah. Um, it, it's such a small amount that it doesn't create a long term like okay. liability. But yes, under current state law, they all grants received to be taxable. OK. And I assume that's going to be communicated to the Guard members and they're going to be very much aware of that and understand that these are taxable benefits. Yeah. I, the the, the yeah. taxable benefit when we broke down the cost yeah. is a very small proportion when taken into when taken in comparison with the overall amount of uh, premiums paid. Yeah. But. Absolutely. Is it going to be reimbursed to them through payroll? I assume is that the mechanism, and is it the tax going to be deducted when you're when you're reimbursing them? If, if you know, maybe it, it yeah. wouldn't it wouldn't be through payroll because oh, okay. most of the guard members don't normally get paid. Uh, aren't aren't normally sure. you know, unless they're on state active duty, they're not normally paid that way. So it would be like a reimbursement, the same way that they do for like educational benefits. Okay. The, the, the only thing that I'm a little bit nervous about is just when, when tax day comes later, if they're going to get a bill, a you know, I, I, I would just be a little bit nervous about that. And cause that, you know, yeah, I, I, I actually hadn't even thought about that, but, okay. uh, but your question about, are we going to inform the members about, you know, these yeah. types of things? Absolutely. It's one of the, the first things we're going to kick off is an information campaign. Okay. Because well, we want to, we want people to know about this and take advantage of the opportunity, take advantage of the, the benefit. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Senator Lamb. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the panel. Um, I just had a, a clarifying question because I didn't know much about Tricare Reserve Select, so I was looking it up, and it looks like it covers health and vision, not dental and pharmacy, right? And yeah, it looks like that's there's correct. two different uh, types of. You you know more about this than I do. There's I, I didn't as a service member. I know that there's two different types. There's the healthcare one, and then like the the separate dental, one. right? I think so, the healthcare one covers vision as well, but not right. Not, right. I think that's not, right. Not like specifically, it's part of the general healthcare bill, uh, right. healthcare insurance. And then the bill itself covers, I guess, reimbursement for health and dental, right? It it does. It specifically names on part on page two, right. Tricare Reserve Select for the healthcare and the Tricare Dental Program. For so why was uh, I'm just wondering then why was pharmacy benefits not covered? Because it's not covered under Tricare Reserve Select, but it's also not reimbursed via whatever mechanism. I, I think it's a great question. I I think it is what was accomplishable with our overall budget ask as we put together the governor's agenda. We priced out dental and healthcare. Um, Certainly, I think prescription drugs, I think the, the, the administration would be supportive of those benefits, but it just wasn't a part of the scope of this particular bill. Is that something you would look at in the future? Because it looks like from the fiscal note, you're still going to be under the projected amount that the, the, that the administration's budgeting, which is, I guess, $5 million each year. So the, the fiscal note drafter didn't give a concrete number on the actual cost because they- It's it, a model. It, it depends completely on how many people subscribe. And- of course, since it's healthcare, people may want to see that it actually works before they switch over to this model, right? But maybe they have their health insurance from their work and they would switch over, what what have you. Um, so the four hundred ninety-seven thousand dollars, I believe, was the figure in the fiscal note. That or four hundred seventy-nine. That is staffing. For personal. Um, we may get up to ten million dollars uh, at full subscription to this. We expect $5 million in this first year. As the general mentioned, uh, a big piece of this is going to be an information campaign. And we're only going to reach so many people with that. Uh, and, you know, as we build this thing out, 
Um, but I would certainly look into the projected cost of the prescription plan, and I'm happy to have that conversation. And maybe this is to the general then. The um, the fiscal note estimated 856 people. Is that what you're thinking, or do you think there'll be more personnel enrolled? Well, we hope it's more. I mean, right now there are uh, 8% of the force are buying their own TRICARE Reserve Select insurance. And uh, another, we estimate through... Uh, federal statistics that there's 7.1 percent of the population that below 65 are uninsured so the first people we're going to go after are those 7.1 percent we think because people are paying for it and they're going to get it for free that that eight percent are going to want to come over pretty pretty early too mm -hmm. because they're already trusting this insurance and of course we want the state to pay for it instead of our own pocket so um that we expect then you know as the program gains popularity that that number will grow up to something like 45 percent of the force possibly okay all right so you looked at pharmacy but it was just kind of cost yeah so I, I think to, to clarify there's two existing insurance programs out there right now that that the service members can participate in and uh, one of them is the general overall health care program and the other is specific to dental, dental. and i i'm pretty sure like all health care programs there's going to be some pharmaceutical benefits to that as well. It's just not a specific pharmaceutical healthcare available to service members. We're, we're trying to uh, get set up a program where we reimburse premiums that are typically paid to this existing TRICARE Reserve Select Healthcare Program. Okay. I mean, pharmaceuticals can be expensive. So, you know, encourage you to, in the future, if they can be, to look at that. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I don't see any additional questions from the committee. So that concludes you, the Madam hearing Chair. on Senate Bill 554. Colleagues will now turn to Senate Bill 550, which is Financial Regulation, Maryland Community Investment Venture Fund Establishment Access to Banking Act. We're going to have Secretary Wu, the Secretary of Labor, as our sponsor. Commissioner Slater, Salazar, I'm sorry, Ramon. Luby, John Bradsakis, John, Brad Fallon, and County Executive Calvin Ball. Looks like everybody's already in place while I was tearing up the names. Good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Good afternoon, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, and members of the committee. Um, for the record, I'm Acting Secretary of Labor, Portia Wu, here to present Senate Bill 550, the Access to Banking Act, which is one of the key pillars of the governor's legislative package for this session. As you know, Maryland is home to some of the richest communities in the nation, but also to some of the poorest. Our state is rich with opportunity, but those opportunities are not equally distributed among individuals and small businesses. We need your support to unleash the potential of Marylanders in every zip code by providing access to banking products and services so we can compete, thrive, and contribute to the growth of our economy. According to the Federal Reserve's 2022 Small Business Survey, access to credit remains a significant obstacle to minority business success. While there is a credit gap between minority and non-minority owned firms generally, that gap is most pronounced for African-American borrowers, with 50% of Black-owned firms reporting credit availability challenges compared with 27% of white-owned firms. Additionally, 70% of white-owned firms reported at least partial approval for financing sought compared with a lower amount of 53% of African-American-owned firms, 49% of Hispanic-owned firms. Also, we know that physical banking locations have been closing in low and moderate income neighborhoods, a trend which disproportionately impacts minority businesses and communities. The Access to Banking Act would ensure that Maryland banks remain in low to moderate income communities. This legislation seeks to improve access to banking for both individuals and businesses, and would do this in two ways. First, it creates an assessment credit for licensed banks or credit unions located in low to moderate income areas. This credit will help to reduce costs in institutions located in these areas and also create community stability and increased investment for both individuals and companies. The act also establishes the Community Investment Venture Fund to leverage public and private dollars and expand access to capital for small and micro businesses that may not qualify for traditional loans. Small businesses thrive in places, therefore, where, where people can live, work, and prosper. 
The basic premise of this fund is to invest in developing products and services that will provide flexible and alternative lending data points or requirements that are necessary to underwrite a loan. Many existing and potential businesses in low to moderate income communities lack access to capital because they simply cannot provide these strict data points or requirements to a potential lender. This fund will help develop, test, and make available these products and services to lenders so that investment is expanded. I'm asking this committee for a favorable report on Senate Bill 550. I'd now like to turn it over to our Commissioner of Financial Regulation, Tony Salazar, to go into greater detail on the operational components of the bill. Thank you, Secretary Wu. Uh, Madam Chair Griffin, uh, Vice Chair Glossmeyer, distinguished members <clears throat> of the committee, for the record, I'm Tony Salazar, Commissioner of Financial Regulation, and I want to thank the Secretary for presenting the bill. Um, as she said, it's intended to improve access to the banking system by incentivizing banks and credit unions to maintain their physical presence in low to moderate income areas. So the incentive comes through an assessment credit against the fees that the banks and credit unions are required to pay each year. The, the credit will be awarded to each branch for each branch that currently exists in a low to moderate income area and for a period of five years for new branches that are established in those communities. If it's fully uh, implemented, it would we anticipate it would reduce our income by about $250,000 a year which is really only 7% of the fund's yearly revenue. So while the proposal will reduce revenue on an ongoing basis, OCFR is confident that the future assessments will remain sufficient to fund its activities. And I'll note that the fund had a balance of over $9.9 .9 million at fiscal year end 22. So, so the fee is not, a, not an issue from our perspective. As the secretary mentioned, it also authorizes OCFR to use up to 2.5 million of that 9.9 .9 to seed a new venture fund that will invest in financial technology companies that can help better use new data or better use existing data or find new data. And businesses will be protected from the development of harmful or non-compliant products because the commissioner will be a member of that fund's governing body. Also, to encourage investment, the OCFR will match Maryland Bank or Credit Union's investments up to a certain amount for a period of five years. So in, in conclusion, the venture fund is intended to be a catalyst to enhance the use of commercial tools like the fintechs have done for consumer funds. And with that, I ask for a positive uh, recommendation on the bill. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Chair Griffith, Vice Chair Klaus Meyer, and esteemed members of the committee. I'd like to commend Governor Moore and the many members of the General Assembly who have supported Senate Bill 550, Access to Banking Act. Bold leadership is required to lift the barriers to economic prosperity for all. This legislation would ensure all Marylanders have equal access to banking opportunities and the necessary capital to start a business and grow wealth. Small businesses are the economic engine of our state and help our communities to thrive. In 2001, in Howard County, we established HOCO Hire, a program to empower early stage and historically underserved entrepreneurs to learn about the essentials of business planning, operations, credit building, digital communication, and financial management. Since this program launched, three cohorts of over 60 businesses have graduated with nearly $300,000 in grant funding for those emerging businesses. In our most recent cohort, 92% were minority or women-led businesses. During the pandemic in Howard County, we launched the Bright Program, which is designed to assist early state businesses with coaches, mentor services, and so far that program has served more than 160 startups. Howard County will continue to promote initiatives that will expand economic growth and more opportunities for our small businesses. Senate Bill 550 will help provide opportunities in these areas and many more to improve the economic conditions for all Marylanders. Thank you for having me, and I urge your favorable support for Senate Bill 550. Thank you. Good afternoon, <clears throat> Chair Griffith, uh, members of the Finance Committee. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Ramon Luby. I'm the President and CEO of the Maryland Bankers Association. 
Founded in 1896, the NBA represents regional, community, and national banks who are insured by the FDIC. Uh, NBA's members operate over 1,300 branches and employ more than 30,000 across the state. Today, I'm here to offer our support for Senate Bill 550, with, which authorizes the Commissioner of Financial Regulation to establish the Community Investment Venture Fund. Uh, as the Commissioner talked about, uh, the fund would develop opportunities, including funding for cert certain initiatives and advancements, <clears throat> excuse me, to assist banks in serving low and moderate income communities. The bill also establishes incentives for Maryland chartered institutions in the form of assessments, offset credits for branches lo located in these LMI communities. Our members are partners in their local economies and are invested in the economic growth, health, and vitality of those economies. Consumers' needs and preferences drive the direction of the banking industry, and banks are committed to meeting the cu our customers' uh, demand for convenience. Banks remain eager to ensure that all Marylanders have access to safe and affordable financial products and services to help them achieve their financial goals. With that, I would ask that the committee give uh, Senate Bill 550 a favorable report. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Griffith and members of the committee. I'm John Bratsakis, President and CEO of the Maryland and DC Credit Union Association. We represent over 70 not-for-profit financial cooperative credit unions, and there are 1.9 million members here in Maryland. I'm here to testify in support of Senate Bill 550. Credit unions are member-owned, not-for-profit financial cooperatives. Their mission and purpose is to promote thrift among their members and create a source of credit for provident or productive purposes. Because of their mission, structure, and purpose, credit unions and their members are often the most hard to reach and in most need communities. Over 50% of credit unions headquartered in Maryland are low income designated, meaning over 50% of their members are in low income areas as designated by the census. They are the same communities this bill aims to serve. The bill will foster collaboration between the government, credit unions, banks, and fintech companies while promoting or protecting consumers through a safe and sound regulatory framework. The consumer protection aspect is important as often financial institutions are put at a disadvantage as fintech companies enter the marketplace with little or no regulation. When this happens, consumers are off left paying the cost of the lack of oversight. This bill helps to remedy that. Our members look forward to engaging with the administration and the department as this moves forward and ask for a favorable review. Thank you. And thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Brad Fallon from the governor's office. I can't say anything this panel didn't already say, so I'll just be here to answer questions and uh, and look good next to this fantastic panel. Thank you all. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the committee. Oh, Senator Hayes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the the definition for low and moderate cross references back and forth to some like United States code or something like that. So it's kind of confusing. Can you all help us? I'm familiar with like area median income and stuff like that, but I'm not as familiar with this US reference here. Can someone help us understand what that is? Salazar, do you want to speak to details on that one? We tried to harmonize picking out a, a standard uh, at low to moderate income definition. I'd have to get it for you afterwards to go exactly into that right now. It's, a, it's not on top of my head. I'm sorry. Yeah, or if, if the chair would allow, maybe if we could get a map from planning just to identify based on that definition what areas are covered. Yeah, that'd be helpful we can probably produce that. Sure. Okay. And then the second question I have, um, there are some exemptions to the procurement code. I couldn't really decipher how it ha how it impacts MBWBEs and those exemptions. Can someone speak to that? Um, so the exemptions were intended um, not for the uh, establishment of the fund, but later on when the fund goes forward so that it would have flexibility. Uh, but the establishment of the fund would be subject to the standard procurement rules, if that helps. I don't think it was intended to get out of the MBE uh, restrictions. All right. We can follow up on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Very good. I don't see any additional questions. I'm looking slowly. All right. Thank you very much for Thank your you. testimony. We do have one additional witness signed up on the bill, Robert Inton. I didn't see him there. Okay. He loves this bill. All right. Well, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 550. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 724 which is health insurance carriers requirements for internal grievance processes. This is uh, the MIA is coming to present this bill. Otherwise it says chair finance. And I was like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee. I am Mary Quay, the Associate Commissioner for Market Regulation and Professional Licensing at the Maryland Insurance Administration. And I am here on behalf of the MIA to support Senate Bill 724. When the Appeals and Grievance Law was passed in 1998, it was a very important step for Maryland consumers and providers. It addresses the requirements when a carrier denies a claim or request for prior authorization, and the denial is based on reasons of medical necessity. When the law was passed, it had a requirement that the carrier give oral notification and then within five days, send a full written notice with appeal rights, et cetera. Well, that was the fastest communication in 1998. But today, many people do not answer their phones and carriers have created member portals and provider portals that allow for secure transmission very quickly. The carrier can send a text that a response has been posted and the member can check it very quickly. Providers still use fax machines, and that is a secure way of sending healthcare information. And the MIA is proposing that oral communication now impedes providing rapid notice to members and providers, and that allowing other means of transmission, electronic notification, would in fact be faster and address the goal of requiring the oral notification. And so we ask the committee to please provide a favorable report on Senate Bill 724. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the committee, so thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we have one additional witness signed up on the bill, Dana Kaufman. Going once. Okay, that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 724. We're going to turn to Senate Bill 725 which is insurance product service offerings. And MIA again, and David Cooney, Robert Barron. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Robert Barron, uh, and I am the Associate Commissioner for the Property and Casualty Division at the Maryland Insurance Administration. Uh, I'm here today on behalf of Commissioner Barain, along with my colleague, uh, David Cooney, who is the Associate Commissioner for the Life and Health uh, Division. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to uh, testify in support uh, with amendment of our departmental bill, uh, Senate Bill 725, um, which is an important uh, modernization of Maryland insurance law that will benefit both uh, consumers and insurers. Um, we've already submitted uh, written testimony providing details of the many benefits of uh, SB 725. Uh, the bill has been prepared by the MIA with input from uh, various stakeholders, and it closely aligns with the NAIC's model language. We are unaware of any opposition uh, to the bill as proposed uh, with our amendment. Um, SB uh, 725 will allow insurers to offer policyholders value-added products and services 
outside of the insurance contract at no cost or reduced cost, as long as the product or service is directly related to the risk of loss associated with the insurance policy itself. Uh, for example, uh, fitness monitoring devices on the life and health side or water leak uh, detection products on the property and casualty side. Uh, the bill has specific guardrails to ensure that these offerings are made in a non-discriminatory manner and that the policyholder's acceptance or rejection of a specific offering may not result in a premium increase um, or a claim denial. Um, these offerings can assist with loss prevention and mitigation and provide for better health outcomes, and they'll act as a stabilizing influence on loss costs and rates, a truly a win-win for both uh, policyholders uh, and uh, the insurance industry. Um, we urge a favorable, favorable report uh, from the committee on this important proposal, and we're available to answer any questions. Thank you. As Robert said, I'm David Cooney, Associate Commissioner for Life and Health, and I'm really just here to answer any questions, so I'll just say me too. Very good. I don't see any questions from the committee, so that concludes the hearing on Senate Bill 725. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Okay, colleagues, we're going to adjust the schedule a little bit and go to Senate Bill 678, which is health insurance reimbursement for services rendered by a pharmacist, Senator Beidel. And again, if you have a panel, feel free to bring them up with you. Well, I think I have a panel, but it might be a little, a little early. Here. There we go. Just, just you, uh, No, uh, Dr. Williams, I'm here as well. And Bilal um, will was here, um, but now with the change, I just sent him a message telling him to hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the Finance Committee. Um, for the record, Pam Beidel, representing Anne Arundel County District 32. And I'm here to present Senate Bill 678, health insurance reimbursements for services rendered by a pharmacist. You all may recall in the last several years, we have added a lot of um, scope of practice to pharmacists, and they're really helping with, um, you know, as we're trying to provide more health care for people. So this bill really um, is a product of the MIA working, working group from this summer that I served on, and, and they made a report to the General Assembly. And it requires the Maryland Medical Assistance Program and the Maryland Children's Health Program and others, including insurance companies, to provide coverage for all services rendered by a licensed pharmacist within the pharmacist scope of practice to the same extent as services rendered by any other healthcare practitioner. Pharmacist patient care services demonstrate improved patient outcomes and reduce overall healthcare costs. According to the Kaiser Family Foundation, there are 47 areas in Maryland that are designated as health, health professional shortage areas, and this includes 19 of Maryland's 23 counties in the city of Baltimore. Pharmacists are one of the most accessible health care providers for Maryland patients, with most Maryland residents living within five miles of a pharmacy. Pharmacists are well positioned to fill patient care gaps, providing services and access. Currently, a pharmacist can only bill through um, their own, like through a big chain pharmacy or through their um, through a physician, but this would allow them to be credentialed and billed directly. And you're going to hear, I'm surprised, but from the insurance companies supporting this, but they would like a, an effective date a little further out. So they're going to offer an amendment. But I respectfully request a favorable um, vote for Senate Bill 678. Good afternoon. Uh Madam Chair and everyone, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. My name is Hoi Yan Trung, pronoun Hoi, like Chip Ahoy cookie. I just had to throw in that Chip Ahoy cookie because late afternoon, everyone may use a cookie, but I'm sorry, I didn't bring a cookie. A patient actually gave me that name. So you can call me Chip Ahoy Pa. Oh, all right. <laughs> didn't call me Chip Ahoy Pharmacist, that's okay too. Uh, my day job, I'm a professor at University of Maryland Eastern Shore School of Pharmacy and Health Profession. And I'm uh, my background pharmacist, a public health pharmacist. I'm very thankful to be here. Uh, as you heard, I also want to thank Senator Bitter for support uh, for sponsoring this bill and supporting the pharmacy community. Pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare professional. Any patient can walk into the pharmacy and receive uh, consultation and advice regarding healthcare. Uh, during the pandemic, when most things are closed, pharmacists pharmacies remain open. 
we dare for the community. And we not only that we serve in our day job, but we also volunteer. For example, I had the opportunity to volunteer with Maryland Response Medical Reserve Corps in which I vaccinate. And unfortunately through that, I brought COVID home for my children and myself also. But at the end of the day, I'm thankful for that natural immunity. You know, that's how we look positive in that regard. Uh, when pharmacists are involved, we help to bring out the cost. I would like to share with you a publication that I did as a faculty to show uh, the long story short, the returning on investment for every $1 spent reimbursing pharmacists, five to $25 are saved for the healthcare system. This is a study that was done in a clinic for the underserved community that we look at uh, a total of 246 patients over a four year period. This publication is available in the Journal of the American Pharmacists Association. And I'll be happy to share the additional data if applicable or if requested. But uh, we identify pharmacists all kind of problem from sub-therapeutic to make the recommendation to increase the dose to make sure it's optimal treatment for patient to catching potential adverse, adverse effect for patient safety. So we're there, we're part of the interprofessional healthcare team, which we just like to ask for this reimbursement to be available for the pharmacists. Thank you for the time and opportunity. Uh, is it, is, is, right. We're good? Okay. All right, uh, good afternoon, members of the committee, Chairman Griffith. Um, good to see you all. My name is Bilal Akwakoku. I am the uh, Government Affairs Manager at the National Community Pharmacists Association, uh, representing just about uh, 19,000 members across the country, just over 300 in the state of Maryland. Uh, these 300 pharmacies uh, dispense out just over 20 million prescriptions uh, to uh, the uh, state's patients, so affecting thousands of patients uh, uh, throughout the state. I won't uh, belabor the point too much. I'll just emphasize uh, some points that uh, my panel has made in, in terms of pharmacists continue to be the most accessible, uh, continue to be uh, amongst the most trusted healthcare providers in, uh, in terms of uh, healthcare. And also, I think if we are going to get past of a lot of these uh, health, professional, uh, health professional shortage areas in Maryland, about 47, we're projected to see a 55,000 uh, shortage of physicians in within the next 10 years, pharmacists can step up uh, where places, specific places where our areas of shortage with physicians and uh, continue uh, to provide uh, competent and quality uh, care to, to patients. So just wanted to reiterate that. Um, and also as someone that who uh, represents a community pharmacist, small businesses, uh, pharmacists need to be able to maintain their business. It's not a sustainable business model if they're unable to reimburse for the services that pr provide, which include testing, immunizations, PEP and PrEP, tobacco cessation, and uh, hormonal contraception. Um, so with that, I hope um, that there's a favorable report uh, by the Senate, and I thank the committee for having me. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Aaliyah Horton. I am the executive director of the Maryland Pharmacists Association. We represent pharmacists, student pharmacists, and pharmacy technicians in the state. We urge a favorable report of SB 678. And uh, the basics of this bill, it's very straightforward. It's a short bill. It's basically saying pharmacists should be paid for the services they provide. Um, we do run into, to, and I would also say that this bill is not a scope of practice bill. It's not looking to ex expand services in any capacity. It's for the services that pharmacists are currently able to do um, to be reimbursed for that work and any future changes that happen so that we don't have to continually come back and ask every single time for those changes. If you recall, um, when we had the discussion with Senator Lamb and the HIV uh, PEP bill, um, one of the concerns was the that pharmacists were not being reimbursed for, for that service. Um, last year, the General Assembly passed um, the ability for pharmacists to prescribe um, nicotine replacement therapy, and there was no provision for reimbursement for pharmacists to do the, the counseling and um, the prescribing, the screening, and everything that needed to be done there. And so we want to ensure that as time is being put into patients, that uh, payers are covering those costs. And as Dr. Trong said, there are numerous studies that show that the return on investment is real, and it can impact the state budget as well as patients' um, costs out of pocket. Um, there are a number, over two dozen um, CPT codes that are currently being used across the country by pharmacists um, to be reimbursed for their services. And so the, the structure, the infrastructure is there. It's just a matter of getting this implemented and making sure that this happens. And that when we do have changes, we don't have to come back every single time and ask for a change in um, the MI in the insurance statute. Uh, 
I will just add the MIA, sorry, did um, submit um, some possible technical corrections. I did walk through with them and we are fine with those. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the committee. So thank you all for your testimony. Um, I have another witness or couple, Matthew Chalantano. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Senate Finance Committee. I am Matt Celentano here today on behalf of the League of Life and Health Insurers, uh, supportive of Senate Bill 678 with amendment. Uh, I want to thank Senator Beidle and the MIA for convening the work group through the summer. I think we made tremendous progress, and I'm here to say that the carriers are in support of this bill, which is great. Um, I do uh, have a quick amendment request, and that is to have a delayed effective date because our systems don't contemplate uh, the new system at all right now. We need uh, time to develop credentialing, reimbursing, and uh, networking process processes. Have you heard the past? The carriers have been accustomed to um, reimbursing the pharmacy, not the pharmacist. So we're going to have to sort of rework the reimbursement structure to be able to uh, to comply with this bill. And we respectfully ask for a delayed effective date to July 1 of next year. Um, with that, uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. See no questions for this witness. Thank you very much for Thank your you. testimony. Uh, two additional witnesses, Deborah Bracato, Laura Bogley. Not seeing either of them. So that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 678. Colleagues will now turn to Senate Bill 601, Maryland Health Benefit Exchange, state-based young adult health insurance subsidies pilot program. Thank you, Mr. Madam. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I if I could bring some of the panel up, I understand, uh, I wanted to impress the uh, committee. I was, I think, uh, County Executive Stuart Pittman had originally planned to be here along with uh, Calvin Ball. We did bring the president of our Charles County Commissioners, uh, Reuben Collins, that uh, was to impress <laughs> Senator Ellis. Um, <laughs> and, but that said, I understand they had to go, our County Executive uh, Star Power Panel. In any event, uh, as I think this committee has heard me say repeatedly, I, you know, Maryland really has been a leader on innovative ways to reduce the number of Mar uh, Marylanders who have no health insurance. I mean, national leader, we've cut the uh, rate in half over the past six or seven years from 12 to 13 percent uninsured rate down to about six percent, while also bringing premiums down. And I, I think I mentioned on the floor a week or two ago, um, it was this committee, the Senate Finance Committee, where we created the first in the nation easy enrollment program that Senator Chris Van Hollen has introduced last week, a national model where you check a box uh, on your federal tax return if his bill passes, but the Maryland provision, uh, you check a box um, saying you don't have health insurance and see if you're eligible for uh, premiums or Medicaid and the like, a prescription drug affordability board, I was just saying, the, you know, first in the nation. So the bottom line here, quite candidly, um, again, the Senate Finance Committee has been at the epicenter of some of the most innovative uh, provisions in health care, health insurance in the United States. And so uh, coming to this bill, uh, a few years ago, we uh, learned of a program up in Massachusetts. Senate uh, Delegate Pena Melanick and I chaired a commission. We brought folks down from Massachusetts that had to do with young adults um, and state subsidies that would allow those folks, young adults, uh, to purchase health insurance. And they came down and they testified here. And as a result of that testimony, we had legislation in this committee, uh, passed the committee that directed the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange to do a study about the viability of establishing a similar state-based individual market health insurance subsidy here in Maryland. And so uh, the exchange, along with the Maryland Insurance Administration, did provide a report uh, to the Finance Committee and the HEO Committee in December of 2020. And in that report, uh, they found that it's that 18 to 34-year-old range, non-Medicaid eligible folks, that's over 138% of the federal poverty level. That was the largest group of uninsured Marylanders. We're talking about 43% of all the uninsured in our state are in this category, 18 to 34. And that, uh, that sweet, there's a sweet spot here. You're making too much money to be eligible for Medicaid, but not enough money. Uh, you're at very high risk of saying, this is one of the things I'm going to drop. I'm going to drop my health insurance. So there is this sort of um, demographic sweet spot that this uh, bill attempts to, uh, to address. 
and was uh, another, I should say, finding in the report was the fact that if you bring young adults, healthy adults into the insurance risk pool, um, that has the ability, that has the implication, you further stabilize the entire individual insurance market by bringing again, young, healthier than average people into the market and to the risk pool that reduces premiums for everybody else in the risk pool. So this is actually a basic tenet of, of insurance law, if you will. And so that 18 to 34 year old group, these are the folks who are most likely, as I said, to drop their health insurance. They think they're gonna live forever, never get sick. So building upon all that during the 2021 session, uh, we had legislation in this committee uh, that created the Young Adult Health Insurance Subsidy Pilot Program that targets 18 to 34 year olds with incomes between 138 and 400 percent of the federal poverty level. And we funded that program at $10 million a year uh, for 2022 and 2023. Uh, came out of this, uh, that particular piece of legislation passed out of this committee unanimously. And the two-year pilot has turned out to be extremely, extremely successful. And you're going to hear a little bit um, about that. So according to the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange in 2022, this two-year pilot, uh, the growth in young adult enrollment increased 11% year over year. Uh, young adults now comprise about 24% of the be health benefit exchange total new enrollees compared to 4%. Uh, in a prior year, we have about 50,000, I want to repeat, 45 to 50,000 young Marylanders have used these subsidies to enroll in health insurance coverage, including um, many thousands who were just brand new to the marketplace. I would also note, Madam Chair, that because Medicaid has not terminated enrollees during this pilot program due, due to the public health emergency that's been in place, uh, the enrollment numbers are probably a lot understated in terms of what they could be in the future. That public emergency is ending in May 2023, and you, I think we can expect that approximately, in fact, the Benefit Exchange did some analysis, about 22,000 young adults have been retained on Medicaid despite reporting that their income change would otherwise make them ineligible. So that's coming down the pike. So we've got this sweet spot. I think we have the data from two years of a pilot. One final note uh, for the committee is that uh, it's been effective in reducing racial and ethnic disparities within that 18 to 34 year old group. And I, I think you'll see in 2022, the young uh, adult subsidy recipients were far more likely to be Latino or black. Um, Latino young adult uh, enrollment grew 13% more than any other population in the past year. So that's another byproduct of, again, attacking this demographic group. So all 601, Senate Bill 601 does, it removes the 2023 uh, sunset, again, to this highly successful two-year pilot program, making it a permanent program. It provides a max of $20 million in annual subsidies. Uh, to this program. Uh, the funding for the pilot came out of the reinsurance pool, which was we extended last year uh, to 2028 with the largest reinsurance uh, program in the United States of America. It was sunsetting last year and this committee passed an extension out to 2028. Uh, this bill would cut the money for this permanent program. We come from that same pool and we have the exchange here can talk about does that have any negative implications on the broader uh, premium, uh, the, the broader uh, met benefit exchange and the folks who use that to get their health insurance. Um, and I would just add the attorney general has weighed in. We've got a lot of favorables, the Maryland Hospital Association and the like. And so um, I don't have that much more to add, Madam Chair, other than the pilot's been successful. This is, helps us, again, continue that downward trend with the uninsured rate. And I think it's um, time to make it permanent. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I know the House would like to move something. I think they're talking about just extending the pilot. That will be up to this uh, committee. But I think the, the data is sufficient to just make it a permanent program at this point. So I'll turn it to the panel and uh, or field any questions. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Vinny DeMarco, President of the Maryland Healthcare for All Coalition. Thank you, Senator Feldman, for putting in this bill in 2021 and this 
bill to make it, uh, the program permanent. Uh, Madam Chair, as the Senator said so eloquently, your committee, the Maryland General Assembly, has made Maryland one of the best states in the country uh, for health care. We have a wonderful exchange implementing what you've enacted, but we have done a lot, but we need to do more. Governor Westmore said in his inaugural address that one of the most important things we need to do to make sure no one is left behind is address the fact that there are over 200,000 plus uninsured people. There are ways we need to do to achieve that, including easy enrollment, automatic enrollment. We need to remove immigration barriers, but we also need to follow Massachusetts' example of additional subsidies. They have an uninsured rate of 3%. They're the best in the nation. We're about number five with 6%. And as they told us uh, in our in the commission, which um, uh, the, uh, Senator Feldman chaired with uh, Delegate Pena Melnick, these additional state subsidies help to break the back of the uninsured rate. And the, these youth subsidies have helped tremendously. 17,000 new young people enrolled, 46,000 people have been benefited from this program. And you'll hear from some of the beneficiaries. And in addition, as you heard from Senator Feldman, we all are helped when these young people who are healthy get on the insurance rolls and that keeps our premiums from going up, keep people from going into the emergency room where we increase our uncompensated care. The fact of the matter is it's a very successful program which you are leading the nation on and we urge you to make it permanent. Thank you very much. Well, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate Bill 601 today. I'm Johanna Fabian Marks, the Director of Policy at the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange. Um, Senator Feldman and Vinny did much of my work for me, so I will just be brief and say that, you know, we have seen positive results from our initial data um, in short, as Senator Feldman shared, we've seen more young adults enroll. We've also seen young adults staying in coverage longer. So I think these affordable premiums are allowing them to keep coverage. They're dropping it less during the year. And um, as Senator Feldman mentioned, we're seeing a positive impact on health equity with uh, young adult subsidy recipients more likely to be Black and Hispanic. Um, and these young adults of color are uninsured at two to three times the rate of their white uh, counterparts. So that's a particularly impactful um, result. And then lastly, um, as was mentioned, with the Medicaid terminations resuming this year, I think this program will be more valuable than ever as those individuals are looking for affordable coverage um, and, and we wanna keep them insured. So I'll wrap up with that and, and I, re I respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ruben Collins. I'm president of the Board of County Commissioners of Charles County, uh, Chair, Griffith, uh, Vice Chair Klausmeyer, and members of this esteemed committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this very important bill. And we're seeking a favorable response uh, by committee to something that is essentially a bill that works. So it's not like there's any mystery. This is something that actually has a benefit to the people and citizens of the state of Maryland. On behalf of the Charles County Commissioners, it is my sincere pleasure to support passage of SB 601. Um, back in 2021, um, the legislature enacted subsidies laws, which invested up to 20 million per, per year for two years to help lower income young adults ages 18 through 34 purchase health coverage. SB 601 would remove the sunset on this important healthcare program. I would also like to stress again, um, as it relates to equity, uh, this actual program reduces uh, disparities in healthcare services within this age group of 18 to 34. In 2022, young adult subsidy recipients were more likely to be Latino or African-American and as a result of that, the numbers have shown clearly as has been stated um, previously, that this actually provides potential opportunities uh, to reduce the gap in healthcare services. In 2023, Latino young adult enrollment grew 13% more than any other population. This program 
as it is, and hopefully as it will continue, uh, improves health equity uh, throughout the state. And again, I'm seeking a favorable response from this committee for this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Neil Bergsman. I am the Senior Policy Analyst for Maryland Nonprofits. Maryland Nonprofits is the statewide network of all nonprofit organizations with more than 1,700 members across the state. Maryland Nonprofits supports Senate Bill 601, improved health outcomes, improved quality of life, and reduced disparities in health care are goals that are of interest to Maryland's nonprofit community, and especially to those nonprofit organizations with missions related to health, behavioral health, and human services. You were smart to establish this subsidy for young adults in 2021 on a trial basis. The trial has been successful and you will be smart now to make this policy permanent. The bill will help the qualifying employees and clients of nonprofits to obtain quality affordable health coverage by facilitating access to primary and preventive care it will improve health outcomes. And uh, Senator Feldman and my fellow panelists have covered all my other points. So stabilize premiums, reduce racial uh, disparities, help soften the Medicaid cliff. For these reasons, Maryland nonprofits respectfully request a favorable report. Thank you. Great, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Jake Whitaker, Director of Government Affairs of the Maryland Hospital Association, here to testify in support of Senate Bill 601. Um, I couldn't have said it better than Chair Feldman or the rest of the panel, so I'll just say me too. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't see any questions from the committee for the sponsor or this panel. Thank you all, and we have a good afternoon. Thank you, we, Madam Chair. We do have additional witnesses signed up on the bill. I'll call forward Kenneth Phelps, Lee Hudson, Good afternoon, you can get started. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you. Um, I remember our reason for speaking in context like this as four A's, we want access to appropriate, adequate, affordable health care. We supported the legislation for the pilot. So I'm here to say me too as well. Well, there you go. I don't see any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, we do have virtual witnesses signed up on the bill. So we'll go to Sarah Burr. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Burr. I live in Baltimore City and I'm here to testify on behalf of SB 601. Um, I am the mom of a 27 year old um, who has greatly benefited from the subsidy program. Uh, my son has a chronic health condition and he makes $15 an hour working as a cook. You know, once a mom, always a mom. While $15 an hour is a living wage, it is tough to live on with rent taking up half of my son's monthly income. The health insurance somebody has, subsidy has made my son's health insurance affordable. He currently pays $55 per month for an excellent HMO plan, which makes doctor's visits and medication affordable. It is a great comfort to know that my son has quality health care. Um, lower income young adults need affordable health care, and I ask that you please vote to continue the Young Adult Health Insurance Subsidies, subsidies Program. Thank you. Thank you. There are no questions from the committee, so thank you for your testimony. We'll go to our next witness, Mason Ann Edmonds, Edmondstone. Good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon, Chairwoman Griffith and members of the Senate Finance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on Bill 601, the Young Adult Subsidy. I'm really passionate about this. Uh, my name is Mason Ann Edmondstone. I'm 25 years old and I live in Fort Washington, Maryland. This subsidy is crucial for young people who, like me, when they're fresh out of school, move away from their families and have to support themselves. I have a marketplace or I had a marketplace insurance plan for the past three years until I was offered 
health insurance through my employer. I can say I appreciated my marketplace of insurance plan tremendously because it was a plan that fit my needs perfectly and I didn't have to be scared to go to my doctor or seek out an urgent care when needed. And I have friends who are also in marketplace insurance plans who work for small companies making a difference every day in the world, but for very little income. And when it comes to budgeting, honestly, their health insurance is on the chopping block. And if the price raises, I, I just can't stand to see people that I care about feel that they need to go without health insurance just to save money. Um, I currently also work in the health insurance field. I know how to sort through and find health plans that cater to individual needs. And I personally benefited from this subsidy. So my health insurance provides me support and answers to so many health questions that I struggle with both physically and mentally. When young people don't have access to affordable health insurance, they choose a cheap plan that doesn't offer the coverage they need. This is something I see on a daily basis in my field. Young adults who need specialists, who need therapists, psychiatrists, and they will stop going to their appointments. They will take half a dose of their medication just because it's all too expensive. No one should have to choose between their money and their mental health. So I urge you to consider keeping the subsidy to consider the accessibility of affordable health care for our struggling youth. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, there are no questions. So we appreciate you being involved in our process. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. You too. Our final witness on this bill is Mukta Bain. Good afternoon. Hi, thank you. Hi, my name is Mukta Bain. Um, thank you for, thank you uh, Senate Finance Committee members for allowing me to testify in support of S. B601. As a young adult, I urge you to support this bill. I'm lucky now that I can choose health insurance through my workplace, but not all malrenders are as fortunate. Young adult age 18 to 34 compromise Maryland's largest unsured age group. It was terrific to see Maryland start a state subsidized program to make health coverage affordable for young adults. In 2022, about 45,000 young Marylanders have used this subsidized to enroll insurance coverage, including over 17,000 new to the marketplace, but it wasn't like this before. I'm thankful for Medicaid covers because it covered my health insurance while I was in and after college. I wasn't straight about paying for my medications and seeing healthcare providers. Everything changed when I started working at the Baltimore County Department of Health. I was hired as a contact tracer, but they didn't provide any health insurance because we were hired as a contractor. I was in a dilemma. I didn't have appropriate options to choose when I visited Maryland Health Connection website. Either the premium or the deductible was too high. For some of the health plan listed, the premium was higher than my rent. I was in a situation of having to choose either to pay for my rent or my health service. If young adults don't have health insurance now, their health problem will increase. Maryland should continue to set an example for other states on how to help residents access affordable health coverage. I urge the community to flavorable report to SB 601. Thank you. Thank you very much. And seeing no questions from the committee, we thank you for your testimony. And that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 601. We'll now turn to Senate Bill 648, Electronic Health Networks and Electronic Medical Records, Nursing Homes, Release of Records. Senator Rosapep, Mr. Vice Chair, good afternoon. Thank you. It's great to be back. I missed a day or two in this committee, but I'm glad to be back. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, so um, big picture, um, people in nursing homes are generally sick. They have serious medical problems periodically, and they often have to go to the hospital. Uh, and the folks who come out of hospitals go into nursing homes. Um, the more we can have folks safe and healthy in a nursing home and not in a hospital, it's better for them and it's better for our whole healthcare system. One of the ways the state has been working on trying to advance that cause is by getting patients' medical records more usable uh, by the healthcare providers. Um, electronic medical records, given the scale of our healthcare system, are incredibly important. And we've made a lot of progress in electronic medical records over the years. Um, so basically what the state has done is tested 
whether use of these records on folks in nursing homes, if provided in real time, um, can reduce hospitalization. And the tests that have been run, the witnesses will talk about the specifics, reduced hospitalization significantly and reduced costs significantly. So basically what this bill does is make sure that the patient's medical records are available to help the patient. Happy to answer questions after they talk. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Senator Rosa Pep. Appreciate your help with all of this. Uh, to give you a little background, my name is Scott Rifkin. I'm a phys internal medicine physician. I practiced in Baltimore County for about 20 years, been involved with nursing home care. I've owned some facilities, although I don't now, and I'm the chairman of Real Time Medical, which is the vendor to CRISP in the program we're going to talk about in, in a moment. Uh, nursing homes want to do a great job. They have issues, though. They have staffing issues. They have funding issues. And any way you can make them more efficient and be able to find information in the medical record to prevent problems is always a plus. Uh, national studies show that about 60% of admissions from the, hospital, from the nursing home to the hospitals are preventable. And there's different ways to address that. What the state of Maryland decided to do under the leadership of the Health Service Cost Review Commission was a test in Montgomery counties and Anne Arundel counties last year, where we used a, a uh, ability to search the medical record for interventional moments, and then a group of nurses that would work with the nursing staff at the nursing home to find those problems. And what I mean by an interventional moment, I'll just give you one quick example that uh, a patient had a hip fracture. Uh, they, they go to the nursing home for rehab for 10 days. They're on narcotics. They get constipated because of the narcotics. They get impacted. They don't have a bowel movement. And if you don't treat them on day three, they're septic on day five or six. And that patient ends up in the emergency room and ends up in the ICU. And you could have prevented that, that uh, $25,000 admission for about 50 cents worth of a stool softener. But you got to find that in the medical record. And that's what this program was meant to do. So the program was uh, done in Montgomery County and Arundel County, dropped admissions from the nursing homes by 25%. And they, they very quickly uh, moved forward at the state health department to create a, a funding for CRISP to do this on a statewide basis. It's being rolled out to every nursing home in the state. Over 100 are already uh, enrolled. And HFAM, Lifespan, and Leading Age have all endorsed the program, which are the three groups. Um, the, 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 the CRISP program in its first quarter yielded a 42% drop in admissions. And if you got that number across the state and all the nursing homes, we're expecting them all to enroll, you'd get about a $200 million savings. So there's a problem with, with uh, medical record companies blocking, blocking the data and the access to the data for their own profit. And we've asked for this legislation for that reason. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Bill Castelli, um, on behalf of Real-Time Medical Systems. Yeah, the, the legislation is very simple, just says that these records shall be made available on a regular basis and that you can't restrict or charge a fee for them. This is information that belongs to the patient. This is for the patient's care. It, it goes directly from Real-Time Medical Systems and advises their care team at the nursing home. So we would encourage a favorable report. Thank you very much. Are there questions from the committee? I don't see any. Just one, uh, Mr. Vi uh, Mr. Vice Chair, there's a, a letter of concern in our bill folders from the Board of Examiners of Long-Term Care Administrators. I don't know if you've seen that. I, I have seen that, and I haven't. I, I just literally saw it in the, in the past couple of hours and haven't had a chance to process it, but we'll get back to you on that. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Seeing no questions, that will conclude the hearing on Senate Bill 648. Colleagues, that is our last bill for the day. We'll take a micro break and then we'll do some voting. <laughs>